cards that were standouts and uh, we didn't really see them. Uh, cards that were overrated and we didn't see a ton of. Uh, basically, I'm talking about both uh, standard and eternal formats. I think that's like kind of the divide you should do. So we're going over just... Dominaria United first? I think so, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, which cards did you want to start off with? Three categories. Overrated, underrated, things I think we're yet to see it. A couple cards that were kind of overrated at the start. Cards like Liliana the Veil kind of flopped. Uh, showed up a bit in the... Uh, it, it showed up at the start of Pioneer, but people have already cut it from their decks by and large. I've seen it in floating around in Rakdos midrange. Yeah, and it's like a one or two of there, and it's fine. But like people aren't playing it in Grease Fang anymore. It's like mostly relegated to like a sideboard option. If they're card that started off really well, but faded out of the format very quickly for standard was a Vold Sleeper, just because people figured out like playing colors in your black decks was better. Shocker. Um, Isn't that mostly because Meat Hook got banned though? Not necessarily. Um, Meat Hook got banned in coincidence with like people learning the format more. Evolved Sleeper didn't really care about Meat Hook all that much. It was actually a threat that could scale up through Meat Hook, but it was just like a fine threat in the Mono Black deck. And the Mono Black decks that exist right now are still good and play it, but it's just like that deck is so much worse compared to. I think Shivan Devastator was a card that it, it still has a lot of potential to see play in a format like Standard. It's just the context of the format really lends to hostility to that kind of effect. I never thought that was going to be a good card. Hard. it's good it's just it's hard when everyone's just playing removal when you like the entire point of the card is just a creature that wants to be played after your opponent's been taxed on them well and like all the creatures that are seeing play are value creatures right and well the reason why is like the value creatures are good so the removal like the removal has to be good enough to keep up with it but the thing is the aggro decks don't get to exist because the creatures in the mid-range decks are really good, so people can, like, attack and block with the creatures in the mid-range decks, and Shivan Devastator can't finish off anyone from the aggro decks because they're at 12. Mm -hmm. like, that's just never going to happen. Well, the main decks in standard right now are, what, Esper, Esper and Grixis. Uh, Esper, Grixis, Esper, Grixis, Jund, or, like, the Jund. black mid-range decks, and then there's, yeah. what, Mono Red, Blue, um, Curious Obsession the deck. The format is basically revolves around the black mid-range decks, but the blue tempo decks are good. They're just, I think they're a good recent development, basically in the pro their prominence, not necessarily their existence. They're a good option against Esper, which is like the leading choice in the format right now. And beating Esper is kind of like what everyone's trying to do. Like Nathan Stewart won Worlds in a field of 70% Esper because he played a Grixis deck that was good against specifically as and the builds people weren't playing. The uh, blue play deck is also like amazingly players. cheap. Yes. And that is, it's like six tickets on motor right now, or at least it was like a week or two ago. I think you can build it, it in paper for 40 bucks or less. Yep. You just need to find 20 islands that you like. I think the model blue deck is good. I also think the model blue deck was a good choice to beat up on the comedy war decks people started to play. I think the comedy war decks people were playing were not good though the versions people were playing were like trying to do like this weird rant plan and just trying to win the game with something like kami war and that can beat something like grixis or jun but every domain shell beats jun and as a good matchup against grixis by default because you're playing her name. the big thing was you're trying to rely on resolving a six drop against obscurus interceptor and air tie and that's just not reasonable but if you're playing the control shell you're playing things like cut down and drag to the bottom and you're playing real interaction and things like Shadow Prophecy, like you actually beat Esper a good amount of time if you build your deck correct. But people are just trying to play this ramp plan, but this the five color domain decks can beat Esper and I think are hidden, like secretly, the best deck in the format, but no one's building it correct. Granted, like I have a biased opinion. I've been playing the five color domain deck a lot, and I've been playing a lot of success against Esper, so I might be have biased results, but I legitimately think that deck is both very good and people haven't figured it out yet and that's a deck that really loses to a good mono blue deck and i think mono blue is the kind of deck that keeps that deck out of the format and keeps esper good any other cards to go i mean i'm sure like what's the next card to go over um i'm a little sad that none of the lords have really saw any play but that, that's more of a symptom of like what standard looks like well, right they're now. just like old they're just eternal cards um uh, mostly but like the goblin I... merfolk and Elf are all great in older formats. Yes, but um, the white one, I think, is actually good. And we're also getting a bunch of Soldier Synergy in Brothers War, which we'll get to that soon. And that card is going to be fantastic in that shell. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited to see what that kind of card can do. 
I can tell you for my part, I way underrated Shieldred. I think basically everyone did. Um, at a first glance, the card seems so pedestrian. Like, nothing of what you read is, like really registers with you. But then you play with it a couple times. like, oh, now I'm at, you know, six life. And a lot of my outs get cut off because it's usually going to be like, cast a draw spell, resolve this thing, take one hit. But now you just don't get to do that. You just lost four life on casting that draw spell. I've been trying to figure out because I what cards I underrate and why. And I think I've narrowed it down to the cards that I overlook for how good they are, are one of two things. Either they are cards that have some sort of requirement that I'm overestimating how difficult it is to do. So things like Omnath Locus of Creation, where it's like, well, this card's obviously great, but it's four different colors. Well, it turns out it's easy enough to get all four colors. Yeah, or uh, that was that's something that a lot of people, I think, mess up on. Another common one is any of the cards that require you to cast a bunch of spells. So Arclight Phoenix, Ledger Shredder, where I look at them and I go, I mean, sure, but like how often are you going to cast, you know, two, three spells in the same turn? It's like pretty often, actually. Mm -hmm. And then the other cards that I underrate are the ones like Shieldred, where they have what doesn't look like that great of effects, and they just have this sort of incremental value that accumulates over time. Definitely. Transitioning into the next segment, um, cards that I think people underrated. Uh, Shieldred is kind of at the top of that list by default. Just card sees play in basically every format. People have brewed around it in Legacy. It sees fringe play in Modern, but it's dominant in formats like Pioneer and Standard. It, just having that effect, it's just good in every matchup. Being able to either stabilize with a giant creature that gains your life every time you cantrip, every time you crack a blood token, every time you cycle something is great. Or just like going to your draw step. Basically just like getting to for like every draw step is just so huge. It's basically a planeswalker. And then cutting off outs for your opponent and punishing them for doing things like casting treasure crews is something basically every single person on the planet. It's great against uh, Ledger Shredder too, since Ledger Shredder, you can't skip the trigger. Yeah, it is not optional to Kanai. Shieldred has that in common with things like Narset. And just like being able to blow someone out with that kind of effect is nuts. Because you can just go, Shieldred, go to kill it, and then you, Kanai, lose two, and then you also lost your shred. Those kinds of effects are very powerful. So yeah, Shieldred shows up in uh, Pioneer Rakdos midrange. It's shown up as a one of in some Yogmoth lists. I've tried it myself. I don't. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good either. But I've seen like some versions of Jun Saga play it against uh, certain blue decks. I've seen certain maybe bad strategies play it, but definitely a big effect in the format like Pioneer, where it's just kind of a really good defective four drop. Cutting off outs is like the thing I think of with this card and very powerful kind of effect to have and it's never bad it's a giant creature that keeps you alive and kills your opponent quicker card that it's personally overperformed for me and especially recently is archangel of wrath uh card seems um it's like at first glance a lot of people really thought it was going to be good and i think they overrated it at the beginning but the way the formats developed i think if you build your deck correctly archangel of wrath is a very good topic specifically you're talking about standard Yes, specifically standard. Six drop never get played because that's really what it is. It's it's a six drop and you have to view it that way. Like you kind of have to get the value out of this. It's kind of if an inferno. It's sort of an inferno titan, kind of. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Is that if it's an inferno titan, it immediately stabilizes the board. It usually kills your opponent's best thing or two of their smaller things. It it just a really easy means to win you the game once you've gotten to the mana board. I think when I've I first saw playing... this card, I just compared it to Siege Rhino and thought that wasn't good enough. Yeah, and it's just like, uh, oh man, I could go on a long kind of rant on Siege Rhino, but I, I think it's more comparable to a card like Inferno Titan, where it just like completely stabilizes the board when you play it, versus something like Siege Rhino, where it's used to finish your opponent off. I've been playing it with a lot of control decks, and I think the card is very good and good against decks like Esper. Because you just want to overload on interaction, and then this card is just a three for zero. It's nuts. Okay, uh, next card on your list. Um, next card, um, Cruelty of Gix, a card that basically no one really looked at in previous season. Oh, I thought Cruelty but, of Gix um, was going to be great. Yeah, and I don't think a ton of people had that opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I have weird perception, but because I looked at has... it, it's a uh, because Eldest Reborn was in Dominaria, and that card saw a bunch of play, and this is similar. Yeah, I I think it's like an interesting mix of like the Eldest Reborn and a toned down version of like Command the Dread Horde, where it's like you interact with them, you get something back, and you usually have all the tools you need to win the game, so long as you're far enough ahead to really resolve this. And read ahead, 
is probably one of my favorite design choices they've made in a long time. It is a great and mechanic. It's so it, like great mechanic, super interesting. Um, I'm interested to see it again. I don't know if and when they can do that in a reasonable capacity. But we're already getting sagas in uh, yeah. Brothers War. None of them have Rita Head. Yeah, which is I think is totally fine. I think using it as like a a niche thing for for sagas rather than like a default setting from now on, I think is a good way to handle it because the balancing is pretty particular with that kind of thing because being able to just like skip the first step and have like when you have to balance sagas to be able to wait versus if you just balance sagas with read ahead. Like a card I think that I would be fantastic with read ahead but unplayable otherwise is something like Phyrexian Scriptures. Like if Phyrexian Scriptures had read ahead, the card would have been busted. It would have been a damnation that also rids the yard, but that sort of design is kind of uninteresting. But then they make cards like Cruelty of Geeks, like, like the Elder Dragon War. And I think, wow, this is a really cool mechanic. It's like, sometimes it's just a raise or a, a reanimate. Sometimes it's a Grim Tutor that turns into a reanimate. Or sometimes you just Grim Tutor and you expect to kill something. Like, it's super interesting. Another point, like, with the sagas and with Cruelty of Geeks in particular, is that you can go to your draw step and then kill something and then put that trigger onto the stack in your main phase. So it, it just... There's so many interesting things with the cards like Rita. You can just go, all right, I'm going to plan to cast this. I'm going to go find Tutor for my removal spell. I'm going to removal spell on my draw step to get my opponent's card in the yard and then get it back. So I've personally gotten back a lot of shielders of this to stabilize my life total. And then like the card that I grabbed is something like a removal spell. And that's sort of just two for one is totally reasonable. Cruelty like, Geeks also plays really well with like Fable the Mirror Breaker. Absolutely. Where you go Fable, make a guy, next turn, discard the creature that you're going to reanimate, attack with your token, generate another treasure, play a land, cast Cruelty, reanimate. Yeah. It, it is, like That's like kind of like the dream shell on the Jun deck, where you just get to do that on four, and it's just like a really easy way to win a game, just putting in time. Yeah, I, I really like some of the diverse play patterns you can make with the card, because it's flexible as just like a really good rice on the grave. And that's that's interesting. I like a card like Rise from the Grave just being playable because it has other things it gets to do. All right, moving on right, to uh, another card. So I think that's mostly it for cards I think uh, people might have underrated and then we figured out later. But a couple of cards I think people should keep an eye on. The first one I want to start with is something people have already started messing with in formats like Modern is Micromancer. I think that card has incredible potential. It has so many things they can do. Sparring like Spike people... already brewed up in uh, Asper Micro deck. Yeah, so there's been a couple of versions. I don't know if it was Spike that originally came up with it, but the first version that people started really playing in Modern was playing Step Through, the wizard cycling uh, card from Modern Horizons. Mm -hmm. And you would find a Micromancer. Micromancer, find Ephemery. You would Ephemery your Micromancer. You would go find Angel's Grace and uh, Spoils of the Vault. Or you'd find another ephemera and just go find spoils plus traverse. Mm -hmm. And then you would traverse, find Oracle, cast Oracle, trigger on the stack, Angel's Grace plus spoils, and you just win. You don't even actually need traverse. You can just grab two spoils. Yeah, you can just grab spoils. One of the good things with Micromancer Oracle. is you can, so assuming it lives, uh, the first thing you tutor is ephemerate, and then you can ephemerate, and then because of all the mana you have, you can just grab all the rest of the ephemerates in your deck and ephemerate mm -hmm. four times, yeah. and then have four ephemerates next turn. And that's what it evolved into. People were just like, well, I don't think I want to put this combo in my deck. What if I just played Micromancer and ephemerates and like a couple of other tutor targets, like a removal spell, like prismatic ending, and some other things, like maybe Traverse. Traverse was one of the ones that made a lot of sense. Because you're already playing four Ephemerates, and you can just play Grief Solitude and have interaction. Yeah, Solitude is the big one, but I think people are putting it in like the four color Omnath shells. So oh, they're just they? playing, yeah, people are playing Omnath plus this card as their four drops, and then playing like Red and Six and Fairy. And they'll just Ephemerate this, or they'll Ephemerate their Solitude, or they'll Ephemerate Fury, and they'll just bury someone in card advantage because you can find prismatic ending off of this you can find lightning bolt you can find traverse the oven wall i think that is like already a, a more obvious space to go into in modern i also think it has potential in pioneer in the most recent challenge actually top aided in a bug shell i believe and people were playing like this actually it might have just been blue black but it was a blue black control shell with this card in it and it was just using it to get like their thought seasons or their pushes or uh, a cling to dust in the main and being able to just like use it at this toolbox card 
and I am super excited to play a card like this basically forever. One of the things I immediately picked up on it when I made the comparison was in a format like talking about formats that I like that are ones people typically play. Canadian Highlander is a super interesting format. If you ever are interested in hearing more about it, the people over at Loading Ready Run do a bunch of Canadian Highlander content, but they also, um, there is Canadian Highlander just like out on its own. I think it's like canlander.com. But it's a points list, and it's basically a 100-card singleton with pointed cards. And you, you can play Recall and Moxin and Lotus, but one of the notable cards in the format that has points values attached to it is Spellseeker. And Spellseeker is just Micromancer as a 3-mana 1-1, one, one, but it finds 2 or less. But the primary effects you find with it are still like Ephemerate and Recall. So like being able to find cards like Ephemerate with Micromancer I think is super interesting, and I'd love to see it more in other 40-card formats like Pioneer. Super stoked about this card, and I think it's also a card people should consider for their cubes. There's a lot of interesting X spells you can grab with it, like multiple choice, mm -hmm. or like some of the interventions uh, from uh, Theros Block, and Mishra's Command from the new set. Like I think that actually might come up in a format like Standard. But yeah, super interesting card, super deep card, and love where it's already going. All right, do you have another card on your list? Uh, yeah. Um, I do think that, and this is kind of a, a little shameless of me, but I do think people should keep looking at the Raven Man, one of like two one, beginning of the chance that the player discarded a card and make a one one bird that can't block four mana tap it each point of discards. The Raven Man just there's so many things that it's deadly trick. There's so many ways to just use this card and continue to get value out of it that I think it's really easy to see like easy places for this to go this card wants to be in higher power formats though uh it wants to be cast alongside power cards like thought seize it wants to be a part of the middle of your curve your deck where you're generating value with it so uh, uh thought seize, fable season pyromancer leliana blood tokens yeah ledger shredder you know any sort of like tormenting voice effects like and it's not just you it's also your opponent and it also affects things like cycling or channel or there's so many things that cause people to discard cards, and there's a lot of very good ones that you can just put into your deck. I do think the card will start seeing more play once people start fiddling with it, but I love this card, and I would like to see it have more play. And then Herd Migration. Play that card. You'll win games. So good. All right. Uh, is your list over? You have more? Uh, that's more or less my piece on it, but there's always more to talk about. I think those are the big ones I think I wanted to hit. Going to uh, the rest of Dominaria, uh, I initially underrated Leyline Binding when I first saw it, and then I was like, oh, right, you can just cast this for one mana. Yeah, uh, I mean, that was my initial thought with it, too. It's just like, I was just like, oh, this is just a one mana removal spell. It seemed like a no-brainer from there, and it took me a little while to figure and out. And it's actually now the best removal formats. spell in Modern. Yep. Uh, yep. There really is a Sarah Paragon I definitely underrated. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people were excited about Paragon, but didn't really understand it. And I, I, I love the card personally. The card's interesting. I think it's um, I think some people still don't quite get what to do with it, but I think that's okay. And I think it's just a really cool four drop in white. It's like it's a mid range a, value engine for either like DNT or just any white mid range deck. Yeah, I've been really liking it um, in mono white devotion. I don't think it's uh, like incredible there, but it's like we don't have a lot of great four drops to play, and this is a good one. Then there is a Temporary Lockdown, which looked so great when it was first previewed and has seen basically no play. Yeah, as a circumstance of other things going on, I don't think it will really break out anytime soon. Cardi is good, and I think has its place, but it's just... I think yeah, the problem is that, it's, that the effect is actually play. a lot more narrow than it looks. It's basically yeah. only good against, like, Rakdos sack. And that's just kind of the fact of the matter at this point. Three drops are good. Fable is great. Until they ban Fable, it's hard to really justify playing this card. Uh, another one, Founding the Third Path wound up doing nothing, even though it looks great. Um, I actually have uh, a word on that. Um, I, I, I'm i going to try and keep this short, but I still am pretty convinced that Founding the Third Path might be one of the best constructed playable cards in this, in this set. And I think part of the reason why it's not seeing a ton of success right now is twofold. One... Uh, Pioneer is in a weird space right now where uh, people are just trying to play uh, decks like Mono Green and Black Red, and those decks are good, and um, people just like have desire to play them, but 
I actually think the best thing in the format is still Blue Red Phoenix. And the reason why I don't think we see uh, more people playing it and more people winning tournaments with it, even though it's won tournaments the past three weekends in Pioneer, uh, including the Mox and the most recent challenge, is that playing Blue Red Phoenix and playing it well is incredibly hard. It is probably one of the hardest decks we've seen in several years, and it's easily the hardest deck to play in Pioneer. Not close. And I think that keeps people away from trying to play this card because playing this card is also hard in that deck, given read ahead and the amount of options you get off of all three chapters. So it's basically a card that... So the first mode requires you to pick from among potentially multiple different spells to cast. You can pick Mm -hmm. any of the three modes and you have to think ahead multiple turns to what those modes are going to wind up doing. And in Phoenix, the deck that has the most decisions to make every single turn and plays on both turns. Like, it is a lot to ask to play this card well, but the ceiling on this card is the highest out of basically any card in in this set. Like, the card is absolutely bananas, but it's very, very hard to correctly take advantage of. I don't know why everyone was so high on Braid's Arisen Nightmare. I don't think that card's very good. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was an interesting card to build around. I'm, I still haven't really tried it in the cast that I wanted to, but I do think it's kind of meh. It is a browbeat effect in the end, so those kinds of effects are going to be worse than the up here in the first place anyway. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, a little sad about that one. Uh, one that it, uh, I think people will kind of gloss over, but I think people will recognize as like a good card for formats is Annoyed to Peacekeeper. Yeah. Uh, having another Spellbinder is interesting. Having a Spellbinder back in uh, standard is also interesting and it does slightly different effects and man does it ever blow out uh the wandering emperor making them pay eight for their wandering emperor plus activation is a big ask <laughs> so um card that i think everyone kind of glosses over but understands is good and uh, is nice to have it once i thought for sure inscribed a tablet would show up in etron decks and it just seems like no one's adopted it yeah i don't know if um uh that's based off of perception or based off of uh playtesting but the math is kind of there like seeing your specific tron piece or a saga is like so likely off of it but i don't know maybe this is maybe they don't need it maybe it conflicts too much with chalice but um yeah i would i would love to talk to an expert on etron to see what they think about the card Mm-hmm. I am certainly not one, but I thought the card was interesting. So. All right, I think that's Sorry. everything from Dominaria. So you want to move on to Brothers War? Yeah, let's talk about Brothers War. Oh, boy. So uh, as a preface, um, I've been doing a lot of like uh, theoretic deck building and a little bit of gold fishing with the set. And I think so much of this set is so good in so many different ways. I think a good majority of the rares in this set are playable and or like could see play in multiple formats. Yep. And oh, man. I, I also just genuinely like the design of the set, but yeah, let's go. Let's start on Urza. Um, I don't think Urza's that good. I think Urza's actually quite good. I will say the effect looks a little pedestrian. And uh, First of all, can we agree that the whole seven mana meld thing, that's not happening? Uh, no, I don't think we can. Okay. On that. I, I do think that is not that big of an ask. And I think in the average game, it won't happen. But I think the return on having that ability is a draw to the deck building when you're playing it. Because I also think Might Stone and Weak Stone are just very good cards. Like, that's just a really good card. A mana rock that helps cast your prototype cards and also either kills something or gets you cards against the mid-range control decks is always appealing. And basically having a natural card to pair with it that for nut draws on five, I think is worth thinking about. I guess, okay, I guess we should establish, because when I'm looking at all of these cards, I'm not thinking of any of them in the context of standard. Sure, that's fair. I I don't think Urza sees much play beyond formats like standard, but I do think it sees some play in the format like Pioneer. I think in Pioneer, I think a deck that would want Urza and would want to make Urza work would be Blue-White uh, Metalwork Colossus. Mm-hmm. I think that deck genuinely wants a card like Urza. But there are, all... I believe there are already other um, cost reducer effects for that deck. That are cheaper you than Urza. Correct. Um, there are other like even from Dominaria, Sten Paranoid Artisan is two mana. Yes, but this card in particular, because it works with one of the new best cards for that deck, being Mightstone and Weakstone, 
like I the big reason why I'm a fan of Urza is because I'm a bigger fan of Mightstone and Weakstone. And if you can play Urza in your Mightstone and Weakstone decks, you should. Because Mightstone and Weakstone is my preferred half of the mill. It's just that if I can include like three Mightstone and Weakstone in my deck, I'm going to play some amount of Urza if, if it's possible. That's that's my big barrier when I'm thinking about Urza. I think Urza as a three mana two four that does cost reducing effect is fine. It's a little pedestrian, but it's fine. But index that want to cast my Sun Weak Stone, he does all the things that you want him to do, and he's just a role player until you have both. And then your opponent also has to be terrified of whenever you have Urza, you could just slam a Might Stone Weak Stone, reclaim the board, and then threaten to go nuclear with Urza very quickly. That's where I think the strength of the card. Whereas, like, with Mishra, Mishra is just kind of like a weird Hell Rider. And I also think the better half of Mishra is Brexian Dragon Engine. Like, Dragon Engine has real play in format, like, actually modern with Goblin Engineer. You can just keep drawing cards mm-hmm. up. Um, I don't know how realistic that is, but I think that's something people will try and find um, so- very good. Moving on, Gix, Yawgmoth Praetor. So this card, uh, in the context of Commander, is very similar to Edric and Timna, but the problem is those cards are multiple colors, so they're automatically better than this. However, if you're looking for an additional effect that does the same thing, it's perfectly fine. Like, some decks play Tusky. Uh, outside of Commander, you basically can only play this... You have to play this in a black aggro deck because you need to be able to play this and immediately attack and trigger it. Yeah, um, I... I think Gix single-handedly puts Mono Black Aggro back onto the map. Yeah, because that deck has like enough good one and two drop creatures, but it just doesn't have anything mm-hmm. great on three. And it's this is a card that's great on three, but it's also just like a Toski kind of effect, which a deck that plays push thought sees and a bunch of efficient one drops would kill for. So I think this is actually the exact kind of card that deck wants. And it like the creature body behind it's also fine, but it's the fact that it turns all of your creatures into Ophidians in a deck that already plays push and thought to get things out of the way. That's terrifying. Like this card could run away with the game. Very quickly. And the uh, seven mana thing, we could just ignore that. Uh, yeah. That's quite frankly failure text. Yep. The other one, uh, the green card hasn't been translated, but it's basically XGG sorcery, make X dryad arbors. Yep. That's whatever. I think it's interesting. Um, I think at a glance, it's a weird card. And I think having weird thoughts about it initially isn't unusual but it's a green effect that makes it's like a green uh secure the waste and it's a secure the waste that also facilitates the prototype cards and i think that kind of effect is interesting i don't know if it's necessarily good but i think it's it, it, like it could have potential so i think it's, a card too, I think it's just too mana and efficient at any cost i think if it was any other color i would say yes but in green specifically I think that might not be the case. For formats like Standard, I don't, I don't think this is probably decent. Next, we got In the Trenches, which is an Anthem that's also a one-time six-mana exile effect. Yeah, that's uh, it's really good. For Standard. Uh, yeah, for Standard, obviously. Uh, <laughs> no other format gets up to six mana in other formats. Usually, have things like Glorious Anthem. But for, for the context of Standard, uh, I think this card is super interesting. Um, I was talking with one of my friends, Dylan, uh, yesterday about this, and we both agreed that we both would have loved this to be the opposite, where if it was an O-ring that turned itself into an anthem, it'd be so much better, but Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's also a big ask. Next, we have uh, Teferi, Temporal Pilgrim, who's (laughs) kind of similar to Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, but is obviously (laughs) worse, but... Oh, I disagree. Um, I think this might be the best card in the set. Legitimately, not, not even trying to... Well, I think making a 2-2, I mean, sure, the 2-2 can be get bigger, but making a 2-2 has to be worse than tucking something. I don't think so. Um, so here's the thing with it. Um, the also, you don't untap ability, two lands when you draw, so that is worse as well. Sure. Um, that's something that can, like, help you secure a game if you untap the walker, but other than that, to fit, like, Big Taff doesn't protect himself. Like, you have to sacrifice a lot of loyalty for... Hero of Dominaria to answer something, and you don't never untap them when you do that, basically ever, unless your opponent's top decking. But with Temporal Pilgrim, his minus two is deceptive because it's not actually a minus two, it's a minus one. And if you can draw a card every turn cycle, it's free. And it just constantly makes you say two twos, I say seven seven. It is not hard to make those cards very big very quick his zero ability facilitates it cycling things like sensor facilitates it casting ops and considers like there are it is 
so easy to just minus two three turns in a row and still have him around and you just won the game on the spot there that's that's in pioneer in standard this card if you can build decks with this card you probably should i think how mid-rangey the format is basically going to be the only barrier to this card people are going to play removal that can hit him immediately so you're only going to get the one two two but it's a lore scale call like it gets big very quickly and your opponent has to answer it or it just gets bigger than their entire board like another thing is um the spirit has vigilance so you're which is really weird for being a mono blue card it, it blue, like vigilance is like a tertiary blue ability it's not common but it, it's it's there but the fact that your opponent doesn't get good attacks or blocks is what i think is nuts is it's terrifying to try and answer, and it also doesn't get Wandering Emperor. Like, the card just doesn't care about Wandering Emperor. You just push through it, because your creature attacks, and it has Vigilance. It blocks the Samurai. It doesn't get exiled. Like, this card can activate three times, and I I don't know how you... I would love to hear how you lose after you minus this three turns around. Like, it's... This card, I think, is incredible. I think, I think it will see play in Pioneer, I think it might see play in Pioneer over to Fairy Hero Dominaria if people will dare to try it. Uh, that's where we're going to part ways. However, I do think it's very close to Hero of Dominaria, and therefore, yeah, it could. It could yeah, it's see. like it's that static is so scary and it's so powerful, and I think it has all the potential in the world. And we're not evaluating it based on its minus twelve, right? No, but I think that minus twelve is doable. Um, it's like Jace is minus. Most enormous yeah. thing um, like you if you get to it sure but that's not what you're evaluating it on yeah it's more just the fact that like you minus two like twice and you're gold and the static is so scary on it it's really easy to just like oops i just got out of range from your attack and you didn't expect that it's there's not a whole lot of planeswalkers that give themselves loyalty in mid combat and that's something people are going to have to experience and like play to which is adds a lot of hidden power to the card but uh, i'm done talking about teferi for now i am really excited about him though. all right mechanized warfare so this card is similar to torbran which already shows up in the mono red aggro decks and pioneer yep uh so it can obviously go there and it also includes artifacts and can therefore uh pump like walking ballista also uh, bowmet courier i think is the big one there's that Bowmax. it also could be really good in rakdos sack because it pumps or it increases the damage on Devil, Anvil, and all the Anvil tokens. Yeah, I don't know about this one. Um, I think the biggest point in this card's favor is that it's a Torbrand you get to play with Obosh. But the problem with comparing this to Torbrand is that Torbrand attacks. This does not. And Correct, and the uh, damage is increased by one less than Torbrand. Yeah, like Torbrand dealing two more meant all of your one drops traded. This one is a little more pedestrian, and... This is the lower to the ground version. Agree. I'm having a little bit of a hard time evaluating this card. I would not be surprised if this card saw zero play or was very good in both Pioneer and Standard, but I currently am skeptical. It also goes with Walking Ballista if there's some sort of red Ballista deck that could exist. In Modern? Maybe. Well, all the decks that play Ballista in Modern are not red, so that's the thing. But if there ever is a red Ballista deck, then maybe. Possibly. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Titania, I am not a fan of. Do you have another opinion? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I will preface this saying that I don't, I'm not confident or I don't know how confident I am in this kind of claim, but I think Titania plus land is a really potential good include in the Fiend Artisan decks. It's a card you can find off of Fiend Artisan in Green Sun Zenith, and it's a very, very threatening late game. And you can find the land off of both crop rotation and, uh, other like search. Oh, so we're talking legacy. Yes, I think it's playable in Legacy. I don't know if uh, it's like good enough for those shells, but those shells can include one of at a very low cost because of the amount of tutors that they have. And flipping Titania is not that hard in a format with like fetch lands and wasteland. And you just need to have Titania plus the land. There's no mana requirement. You just put him in play. And she just kills your opponent. She's big. Like she's going to be like a 4 4 or a 5 5, but that's big enough. I'm not well, saying no. She's going to be an eight-eight, right? Because she returns oh, yeah, all your graveyards least. to play, all your grave lands to play. Yeah, so at least an eight-eight. So have fun. So, yeah, she kills your opponent. I think she's potentially quite powerful, but I also wouldn't be surprised if no one ever tried it. 
See, I'm evaluating her based on the the meld not being that easy to do. I think that's a fair consideration. I also don't think it's that hard to meld. Like, that is not a big ask. You also, again, don't have to put any mana into it like the uh, like you do with Urza. Granted, Urza facil facilitates itself, and so does Titania. But I also think just playing the land isn't that bad. Like, it's a land that just makes a 2-2. Yeah, the land's fine. We'll get to the land later. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about the land when it comes up. Uh, Siege Veteran is Woo! Luminarch Aspirant, except it costs one more mana, and it makes your uh, soldiers become 1-1 one -one soldiers if they die. Yeah, it's Wrath Insulation for your soldiers. Um, yeah, it's a Luminarch. It'll probably see play in Sander because it's a Luminarch. Will it uh, see play in Pioneer Humans? Uh, no, but it could see play in Pioneer Soldiers. So I was looking, and a lot of the white human creatures are incidentally soldiers anyway yep so uh the obvious ones are like all the thalias champion of the parish and thalia's lieutenant are all soldiers but there's a whole bunch of other human creatures that are also soldiers yeah so notably there's been people who have tried like the soldiers deck in pioneer before it's like closer to the inception of the format but i think um with the additions of the land i think with a couple of other soldier payoffs i think it might be worth trying and like, being able to attack a preeminent captain and putting in something like Lavinia the Tenth is pretty interesting. I think we might need something like Captain of the Watch before we ever really think about preeminent captain in a serious way. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think the card's interesting. I think I, it has potential in formats like Pioneer, but I think it'll see play in standard. That's fine. Painful Quandary, just briefly. So this is a reprint from Scars of Mirrodin, which means it's Pioneer <laughs> legal. Now, it has seen absolutely no play whatsoever in Modern or earlier, but this card I've seen in EDH, and specifically there, it gets out of hand really quickly, even in a 40-like yeah, that, format. that sounds about right. So I'm just wondering if this can be potentially a win con in like the mono black devotion deck. You know, I had thought about that, but that deck is really good at like pressuring the opponent's life total kind of passively. So I don't know, maybe like the deck gets to five mana. So it's competing with yeah, Grey Merchant there, but I think this is better than Grey Merchant as a like control finisher, essentially. Sure. Maybe you play it in the board for the control decks and like they have to answer this before they get to do basically anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that seems interesting. Yeah, I could see it as like a sideboard card for that purpose. All right, Brotherhood's End is definitely a playable card at minimum because it's basically Anger of the Gods, but it's also Shatterstorm for three mana. Yeah, um, holy moly, this card is very good. Uh, so notably, it will not answer Nykthos Ramp's bigger artifacts, but it, pretty much any other matchup that you'd be siding in an artifact sweeper for, it will kill everything. Yeah, so... um. In there's certain decks, especially decks like Phoenix, that have wanted to or have been forced to play a braid to have answers to things like Oven or Hearse and like as like a way to also get creatures off the board. Now you just get to play this as both your sweeper and your artifact interactive piece, and it's really good at both of those things. I don't think like, you can cut a braid though, because Phoenix needs to answer God Pharaoh's statue and the like. Uh I don't I think that's what you have to say. We'll start spell pierce for. I also don't think cards like Karn are long for the world and Pioneer. But, well, um, with this set specifically, they're making a real push to get Karn banned. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to some of the artifacts there, but um, I'm not really thinking about a world with Karn in it when I'm talking, thinking about Pioneer at any time in the near future. Um, if we're specifically Atlanta, like we're going to be living with Karn, but I don't a long shelf life after that. Um, but Brotherhood and being like a cyber card for Phoenix for things like red black sack or the aggressive decks and just also being able to hit a hearse and all the crap that's left on the board is really big game for that kind of deck mm -hmm. moving on we have lauren of the third path which is white reclamation sage that has two other abilities that are okay but it's white reclamation sage yeah the first ability being legendary so you can pick it up with Krakus. Mm -hmm. fantastic card 10 out of 10 uh playable in all formats yep not oh. really much else to say about it. The whole you and your opponent draw thing is kind of like, So I uh, guess that's an option. It has niche applications in formats like Legacy, where it can technically be a way to beat Thoracle, but it's it also works with Spirit of the Labyrinth. Like, it's it will come up. It's just not the reason why you're playing. So DNT, it's also a human. So once again, Pioneer Humans can play it. Yep, Pioneer Humans, super happy with casting it. Uh, if and when we ever get modern humans back in any real capacity, this is a great option to reach for instead of Night of Autumn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, card is fantastic. No notes. 
All right, uh, Drafna, founder of Latnam. So this card I only see as a uh, CEDH commander because you can pick up Isochron Scepter or copy Isochron Scepter and various other artifacts, but primarily Scepter. Outside of ED, and uh, the problem in CEDH is that you're competing with Urza as the mono blue artifact matter commander. Now, outside of that, I really doubt this can see play in competitive formats. It's just too expensive to use any of his abilities. If you have 10 mana and an Ugin's Nexus, you win. How is that? You copy? Okay, oh, so you, you, co so you copy, you copy the Nexus, spell, and, and then, then Legend roll one it. of them out? And you do that every turn. Sure. Uh, so, so wait, so you need five to cast Nexus, and then you need three to copy the Nexus and two to pick it back up again. Okay, yeah, so you need ten. Correct. Um, joking aside, I do think this card has potential playability in mind. In things like the Keen Index in a post Karn world, I think this could actually fill the job of like actually finishing off your opponent or actually getting you to the point where something like a uh, Aether Flex Reservoir is lethal. Like what's uh, lethal? Aether Flex Reservoir. Because okay. if you have this plus Keen plus Mox, you have Infinite Storm Town. Sure. And I don't think that's an unreasonable setup for this kind of deck. That deck also wanted another blue legend that turns on Mox Amber. So having another yeah, one that's, that's actually just, that's just reality is chip, though. I think this card does things that reality chip doesn't, and I actually think it's really interesting. I also think in post board games with this card, it's insane against counter magic. Your opponent doesn't get to counter anything you play. Yeah, that's that's uh, reasonable. So I think this card actually has playability in degenerate decks and pioneer, specifically usually with decks involving paradox paradox engine. It will see basically zero play other than that. But I am. I'm interested in Brewer with this card. Sure. We have Diabolic Intent reprinted from Planar, uh, Plane Shift? Yeah, Plane Shift. Plane Shift, yes. And, I mean, it's Demonic Tutor that requires you to sack a creature, which is not an insignificant cost, and therefore can go in any of the decks that are already sacking creatures, like Rakdos and Junsack or Yawgmoth. Yeah, I really like it in uh, Yawgmoth and Modern. Uh, I think sacking Yawgmoth to find Yawgmoth specifically, or Necromantia in Game 2, I think is... Great, but uh, I actually don't think the decks people are suggesting that this goes into Pioneer are actually good suggestions. Um, I think trying to put this in Red Black Sack is a trap. I think trying to put this into Abzan Grease Fang is worse than putting Eldritch Evolution in your deck. I agree with Grease and... Fang, but uh, the Sack decks really need Mayhem Devil every game, so I think it is good there. So, yes and no. Um, the deck can win without Mayhem Devil. I also think that investing a creature and this into finding a Mayhem Devil and then either trying to cast it on the same turn for five mana or passing the turn and hope your opponent doesn't thought seize you or is just ready with like something like a removal spell after you cast the obvious I'm going to go find the best card in my next spell is maybe a bit of an ass, but I also just don't think the card does what you need it to do. Like Generally speaking, Red Black Sack has a pretty flat power level curve on like how strong the cards in the deck are except for like mayhem devil and i think a five mana mayhem devil isn't that great i think there's some things people are uh are suggesting that could be good um uh, red black sack is currently playing like some amount of copies of karizev's expertise in the main i think karizev's expertise in your opponent's like cavalier and then immediately sagging diablock intent is potentially a big game but i think if it sees play it's like a one or two of as like an additional part of like your deadly dispute package like in that kind of village rights kind of slot but i don't think it's actually that good in red black sack i think it's actually fantastic in jun sack because it helps you find corvold and trail of crumbs every game and those cards have a massive delta with the rest of your deck in terms of what they do that deck also plays a bunch of more interactive cards on the sideboard that kind of has to have access to but can't always reliably get to things like assassin's trophy but Diabolic Tank gets you, and you're also less concerned about the mana because you have things like Goose to accelerate you and push you past to be able to double spell with Tank. I also think Diabolic Tank has potential playability in Mardu Grease Fang. I think Mardu Grease Fang in a deck that's playing Epicure plus uh, Fable plus Stitcher Supplier actually wants a card like Diabolic Tank. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the Devin O'Donnells of the world that think it's going to be very good in a deck like Black Red Sack, I'm not sure. I would be surprised if it saw zero play, but I also think that it's a little over. Um, I think it can also go into combo decks 
not necessarily just Yawgmoth, but if there's a deck that's playing like Oracle that also has a bunch of creatures. So for example, could Gift Storm just splash black for this? I wouldn't want to sack one of my dorks to cast this. Hmm. Especially when Gifts and Given just wins the game and your entire deck's already built to cast gifts. And like if we had any amount of like black fast mana, I think we'd be having a different conversation. But all of your fast mana is red and also trying to make black and then casting your blue spell is a bit of an ask. Also, um, one thing that's notable, uh if you have fetch lands, which you'll have, uh you can any deck can potentially just fetch Dryad Arbor to sack to this. Sure, any deck that wants to play green fetches. But uh, it's, one of the things about a card like Diabolic Content is that I think you already have to want to be killing your own creatures to make this a reasonable card to cast. Because having to pay the mana investment and the card investment into casting your creature and then spending your Diabolic Intent, then to find the card that you actually want is not... Like, I think you're asking yourself to get hurt. Oh, also, this can be in Lotus Field in uh, Pioneer. Do not put this card in the Lotus Field. If you tried second Arboreal Grazer to your Diabolic Intent, I will come for you. Do not, not do that. You've got Grazer and you it's and you can just cast uh, Vizier. Dark Petition already, Avi! We have Dark Petition! <laughs> it's already Demonic Tutor. I would at least try it, see if it's good. Moving on. Yeah, moving uh, on. Fauna Shaman is a card that looks way better than it is because it's not survival of the fittest and it sees no play in modern. So is this card good enough for Pioneer? I don't think so. What do you think? Uh, I think it can see some play. Um, I'm not like incredibly excited for it. I'm not really like, oh yeah, finally I get to play Fauna Shaman. It's just, you know, it's, it's an option people get to reach for in... Like, there's maybe elves decks that want to play this. Um, decks that want to just like put in as many Shaman of the packs as possible. Uh, and it's... Like, it's also a card, like, every one of your creatures is kind of like a kill on sight, so playing this isn't that much scarier. Not a card that I think is, like, already demanding of a home and, like, already eager to see play, but people can play it. Yeah. Just every time I've tried to play Fauna Shaman before, it's never been good. Yeah. Fauna Shaman's more of a cube card, and I think that's okay for it to live. All right, we've got Kayla's Reconstruction, which is too expensive. Your thoughts? I don't think it's too expensive. Um, it You have to... So... You have to pay at least know, five for it, right? I don't know. This, this is a weird card to evaluate. I do think that um, it is probably too expensive. But I don't want to say I want to count it out immediately. But that is my initial instinct. And I'm willing to count it. Just like, it's very, like, it not only is it expensive, it's also triple white. And you have to really build around it. Yes. I mean, putting artifacts and creatures in your deck isn't that big of a build. Uh, it's but... No, but you have to have enough of them that you're going to hit multiple ones in the top seven, which is not that hard, I guess. But yeah, I mean, people play with four collected company in their deck, and this one's an easier like to fulfill collected company. I do think it's less efficient than collected company and that matters. But I think in a deck like, I don't know, mono white control standard or mono white devotion, even in Pioneer. Um, could play a card like this and not feel embarrassed about it. Because it also looks at seven. That's a lot of cards. Mm -hmm. So it also, unlike Collect a Company, it scales up really well in the late game. It's like, all right, I'm going to spend all of my mana on this and put five things. All right, go. Like, Indeed. That's powerful. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying it's something people will do, but well, that's powerful. All right, moving on. We have Hercule's Final Meditation, which is a Cyclonic Rift and Commander that costs 10 mana. Now, do you want to spend 10 mana on Cyclonic Rift? No. I mean, no, but... And the turn's powerful effect. It is a powerful effect. But I reiterate, do you want to spend 10 mono on Cyclonic Rift? No. No. Yeah. But one, one of the awkward parts about this card is that it's an instant and it has that base cost attached. So there's no other way. Like, it's not worded in the way that you can cast a spell as though it had flash if you pay more. Cast it and then just cast like a quicken effect. No, it's just stapled into the card anytime you would go to cast it and it's not your turn. It always costs three more. It does not care. Indeed. You can cast it for nine if you somehow get it in your graveyard and use Torrential Gear Hulk. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Um, ugh. All right. Next, yeah. we have Ashnod, which is a uh, a creature. Which Man, is... this is a lot of words on it for a one drop. It gets me excited. We've got Death Touch, and we've got whenever it attacks, you can sack another creature to make a Power Stone, and then something that costs too much. So I don't actually think this kind of effect costs too much, especially on a card that creates mana and a card that naturally wants to scale up so i played a lot of weird decks in pioneer and a lot of decks that have played a lot of weird legends just for the sake of turning on mox amber um i played a lot of like white x legend aggro decks with like four kytheon and things like 
Valentin Dean of the Vein or Zergo Helms, uh, Zergo Bell Striker. But Ashnod being a one drop with Death Touch, so it always trades, so people don't want to block it, and has additional text is basically all I want for that kind of strategy. But I think it's really easy to underestimate that activated ability. Five mana seems like a lot, but it's really easy to get to five mana in a lot of games. And a, like a mana sink on your one drop that already has the ability to trade if you need it to is actually pretty good. And it also fuels itself. So if you're trying to kill all of your own stuff, you can just use that stuff that you killed to make three threes and just continue to keep, keep the thing rolling. Like, I actually think that ability is really good. I don't know where Ashnod's going to see play. I have no clue. I know I will try it in my Mox Amber aggro decks that's trying to play four plaza of here, four Mox Amber, and trying to just jam an Adelan to every game. But mm -hmm. I think this card's better than it looks like. Isn't it really and awkward that because it's legendary, you can't sack another one to it? Sure, but that's part of the reason why I like it having Death Touch. You trade with it and you play the other one, like, crap, now I have to trade with this other 1-1 one, one with Death Touch. Like, I, I think the card not, like, sacrificing itself is fine because it already has the ability to trade off when combat is happening. So, I don't know, it seems fine to me. All right, moving on. We have a card that's worse than Chandra Torch of Defiance, so it won't see play anywhere outside of Standard. Is it good enough for uh, Standard? I don't even know if that's necessarily true. Uh, it, I, I think saying worse than X card is only true in, like, a generalized sense where card x has a job it does in mid-range decks and its flexibility in those mid-range decks is important but so visions of phyrexia the turn you play it you get a power stone. you immediately go to six for your next turn it does not care if you exiled a card to it or not at the beginning of your end step you get a power stone. you didn't play a card mm -hmm. um, but it is an outpost siege that also does something when you don't get to play the card and in a world with prototypes that's really interesting. I'm not saying it necessarily will see Pioneer play, but if there is a red deck that wants to cast big spells, this is an option and a good one at that. I think I do genuinely think that the power stones are really misunderstood and I think they're actually quite... I will say I am being glib a lot here just for the sake of comedy. I still think Chandra is just much better than Visions in most cases, but... I do think that's true. I don't know if you want to ramp. I get... oh, no, Chandra's even better at ramping. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Chandra's better than this card. Yeah, so moving on. Moving on, uh, we have uh, Get Wrecked Amulet Titan. It's a four mana sorcery, and it reads Get Wrecked Amulet Titan. Your thoughts? Really don't like that deck, do you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I'm super happy about a card like Favorite Mystery existing. Um, having another version of the Spect and Pioneer is super nice, and having it in a color that didn't previously have it is super cool. Yeah. Really it's just like the best. Card. It's the best Shatterstorm of all time. I don't think that's necessarily an act, but it's just the fact that it hits everything and it doesn't cost five mana. It already does more than a lot of cards people were previously playing. And um, notably, it will also hit Urza Saga and all the Urza Saga decks. Yep, and all of the constructs that they made. It's fantastic. And when I first read this card, I misread it because I remember Rampage of the Clans from Ravnica Allegiance, and I thought it was basically yes. that card. And then I was like, oh, no, it's you only get one token, regardless of how many things you blow up. Yeah, and if you just blow up one of your own blood tokens or your flip saga or whatever, you still get a 2-2. All right, well, so, pretty uh, self-explanatory. It's awesome. So moving yep, on. Super excited. We have Soul Partition. Can you explain to me why people are excited about this card? Because I'm not yeah, seeing it. Yeah, it's a removal spell in white that also protects your own things and having an unconditional removal spell like this is fan friggin test okay but it's not really a removal spell so yes your opponent can eventually recast the thing however like cards like elite spellbinder have been played over before yeah but elite spellbinder is a creature that like attacks it is. people yes but white also just doesn't get cards like this they don't get cards that just kill things and it also doesn't really matter it's really agnostic on what the permanent is. And sometimes you just need two turns for it, or you're going to kill your opponent in those two turns they would have to recast. Like, I think this card's super powerful. Um, doesn't see it in a ton of play in formats besides Standard Pioneer. Uh, we'll fully disclose that. But I think in formats like Standard Pioneer, this card's worth noting the modality of the card to be able to save your own thing and you can ca recast it for regular cost is good. Like, that is something to not ignore about the card. Also, being an effect that saves your own card is good. Hmm. 
All right. Uh, you'll have to take these next ones because I am not enamored of any of these commands. All right. So currently we've got four of them. We have not seen a green one yet. But let's start with Urza's command. So Urza's command, four minute instant, it has four modes. And I will say for the design of these cards, I am super thrilled. Because part of the problem with the previous commands is that all they ever did was utility interaction and uh, some sort of card advantage. I think that's super uninteresting. And when you get always get two of them, these cards are more niche. These cards actually demand you do deck building around them rather than just jam them in your mid range deck. Because there's so, a command basically Urza's demands command, that you play some kind of artifact or ramp deck of some kind. Yeah, so like it, it kind of demands that you play a um, a slower artifact deck if it's going to see play. Like creating a construct, pretty good. Uh, scry one, draw a card, pretty good. Creatures you don't control get minus two, minus zero, and save you in a pinch. Not as good as something like Crypt Command, obviously, where it just like, tap downs all your opponent's stuff. But like it's a playable version of that kind of effect. I think they're they the fact that they're very different is something that i like design wise um i i'm not super convinced that very many of these will see much play but i have to say i love the design on it i think the design on it is super interesting i want more cards that are i want more commands like this especially but more modal cards that are basically more, more cards that more that. cards that are about interesting decision making and deck building and not so much big value bombs that just yeah when they let game. me kill thing and draw a card or kill thing and they discard a card or kill thing and get back my creature like that's that's significantly less interesting than actually having to make decisions but part of the problem with that is that we have cards that do that just kill thing and draw a card and it's hard to want to play this over those so but i think urza's command is um one of the weaker ones but uh i think i love the design yix's commands uh, the modes on this one is actually um, a little bit more kind of like just doing good things, but it's not just, they're all conditional, but I do like putting two counters on a creature and against lifelink. I do like destroy each creature with power two or less also being like a reasonable sweeper, double raise dead. And then um, the sack their biggest thing uh, effect. Like I think all reasonable and i think being able to choose any two of them will come up in a lot of situations and formats like standard i assume um, the best modes are obviously power two or less if your opponent has a bunch of things but in the absence of that probably uh double raise plus sack yeah um i think most of the time when you're casting this you're probably going to be killing something of theirs and either pressuring them to try and end the game quickly or getting to and i'm super excited about that though um I'm going to skip to the white and the red commands before we keep moving along down the chain. Um, Kalis command, I think, is of the commands, I think currently is the most eternal playable. If nothing else, it's a three mana 2 2 that does something. I love how they're leaning more into this tithe effect of going and finding a basic planes. It lets the white control decks actually exist. And being able to just make a 2 2 and find your basic is a good default mode. I think having default modes for commands is fine so long as they're not just like kill thing draw card i think that's super boring but i think this one's actually a reasonable one and it's it could see play and like pioneer human sideboards i think it's actually like does a lot like gaining double strike is also something that's like killing someone out of nowhere is something you could do with this card and that's not something we see on a lot of mobile cards does out of nowhere really apply when it's a sorcery mm, it, there's a lot of matchups where uh, your opponent is going to have to like tap out or something and they don't expect a card like it's your opponent having to make preparations based off of typical board states and then you surprise them with this card and they have to make blocks they didn't have to. all right and you wanted to move to mistress command next i'd like one of the commands being an x i think that's actually something that's super interesting in the space they have explored very little i think the interventions are like a good example of that but there's like there's only two modes mistress command is also one of the kinds of cards that i I'm interested in playing alongside like a card like Micromancer. I think X spells are cards that you can play with Micromancer in formats like Standard and Pioneer. And this one is actually pretty good. Being able to rummage and or kill two things is really good. And it's flexible too. So if you only need to like finish off a small creature or if they played a Wander Emperor and made a 2-2, you can just use this to kill them. Like I, I like this. I think it's actually quite good. Trades reasonably with a bunch of things in the format and interacts well with specifically wandering emperor so thumbs up for me also you can just kill your opponent which 
I'm in. All right. And that's the commands. So moving back up to Felden. Yeah. Rodom Excavator, which is okay. So whether this card is good depends on how easy is it to actually damage it. Yeah, like your opponent block. Sure. I mean, you could just play it in mono red aggro and standard, I guess, as a two drop. I also think this is playable. And like, I don't think if he's a ton of play other than that, um, but I think that's okay. I would love to see someone do the deck building puzzle of trying to activate this to try and like get a free card every turn. That see, sweet. I'm trying to I'm trying to break it in terms of either doing something like unholy heating him and then getting access to six cards or having a way to ping him every turn. Yeah, either pinging him or like unholy heating him sounds interesting, but I would want to like star extinction him and exile up my library. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I mean, not sure. I think hilarious. I think there's just probably not any good efficient ways of doing that. So I think he'll be I, I, I think he'll just be relegated to being a haste guy in mono red aggro. Yeah, and I think that's totally reasonable because it's just two two that gets in that your opponent eventually has to answer, and if they have to block it, then you get a card off. Cool. All right, moving on to Herkel. Yep. So I would assume that the, I mean, I guess you could play any types, but I would assume the easiest one first off is going to be Artifact so that you can go Herkel and then like immediately play Mishra's Bobble so that your trigger does something. And then the next most obvious cards are instant and Sorceries that are one mana and replace themselves. So I think reasonably oh, you can build a deck that is two to three different types of non-creature spells and then try, but you'd have to play enough of them that are like really cheap like cantrips that replace themselves so you can cast enough of them in one turn to trigger it. I think trying to do multiple types might be a little bit of a trap. Um, yeah, the other way not, is that you can just look at it as like a Phyrexian Arena type card where you're just trying to draw one card every turn. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons I actually like it is because it's not just draw a card, it's look at a bunch. Um, being able to dig for certain types of effects is actually pretty powerful. Um, one of the interesting things is that it doesn't have to match all the exact typings. So if you cast a Bobble, you can fight it in the Dark Steel Citadel or like a cranial plating or a thopter monitor or something. So like you don't have to match the exact typings. You just have to hit the thing that shares that was the original type. So uh, your bobbles and your uh, whatever like cheap artifacts you're playing, turn on and find your win conditions. They find your thought monitors. They find, uh, I, I, I think like the modern eight cast deck is basically like my go-to with this kind of card. The modern able to, oh, like affinity. Yeah, yeah, the the mono blue affinity deck where it just plays thought cast plus thought monitor because it just immediately hits something and it gets a bunch of digs at something interesting and then it plays a large smattering of artifacts. It's very hard to miss with this when you cast an artifact. So the obvious, the dubious part of it is playing a is if you don't have bobble, then it's playing a three mana creature that doesn't do anything the turn you play it. Yeah, and that's part of my hesitation with it. So um, I think it's a super interesting card. I think it's a sweet card to include in like your cubes and being able to build around this in a bunch of different ways in your cube sounds interesting. Like you could put it in your super friends deck and just find a planeswalker every turn. Yeah, so moving on. Did you want to talk about gruesome realization? Uh, briefly. So a bunch of three mana black card draw spells have been playable in like standards past. None of them have done what Grim Gruesome Realization has done, and the fact that it kills cheap creatures in the matchups where drawing cards is bad, so it makes it more main deck playable. Um, it's just the only problem is that that effect currently isn't good, and we haven't had three mana black card drop been good in a while, but it's something worth noting. I think the card is potentially playable, and I like this turn on the design. Mm -hmm. Then we've got Obliterating Bolt, which is Lava Coil, except it also hits Planeswalkers. So if you're playing yeah, Lava Coil which, on your sideboard, just swap it out for this card. Uh, I think it actually goes beyond that. Or I add think, more. Um, I think it also actually starts to take the spot of Dreadbore in some decks uh, in Pioneer. The fact that it hits Planeswalkers means that it now kills 90% of the things that Dreadbore already did, but it also exiles, which currently matters. Like if you're playing in Atlanta... Play a obliterating bolt in your main deck and Rakdos because you can exile troll with it and also kill card. You don't you think it just straight up replaces Dreadbore? Because there's things Dreadbore hits that this doesn't. Straight up replaces no, but there's a lot of versions playing like three Dreadbore right now, but you can play like one bolt and one Dreadbore and like a go for the three. So you mix and match them. Yeah, I think diversifying your removal is better than just playing the goblins of the same. Having more options is good. Especially when they do the same thing 
a lot of the time. I would actually like to take a brief uh, second to talk about Audacity. They fixed Rancor, and I love the design on it. Um, perfectly reasonable in things like Pioneer Boggles. Like the card, super cool design. Not sure how much constructed play we'll see, but I love it, and I wanted to talk about it. All right. Takazi's Welcome is kind of like Welcoming Vampire, which itself doesn't see much play already anyway. So uh, sees a good play, good bit of play in standard, and sees fringe play in pioneer. I think Takashi's welcome is best friend. You make a two, you make one of your tutus, you draw a card off of it, grows your tutu, and makes your. It also works with wandering emperor and wedding announcement, and so many of the cards that just incidentally create tokens. So, do you think it could be a mono white sideboard card alongside wedding announcement? Possibly. I don't know if that's. I don't think that's the kind of thing mono white wants to do. I think you look at it as a card draw spell rather than you play with small white card. I think if you're making tokens, I think if you're casting three drops and you want to draw cards, you look at this card. I think it's less like Wedding Announcement where it's a card that is hard to interact with cleanly and more just like, like I'm going to draw four or five cards off of this. I guess also in the uh, Esper deck, you can loop Phyrexian Missionaries and trigger it. Yeah, uh, like basically everything in your deck triggers it other than Interceptor. But Wedding Announcement also triggers it. Fable triggers it twice. Uh, Wandering Emperor triggers it. Like, the fact that it counts tokens doesn't make sense to me because it's just bananas. Well, they made it only trigger once per turn, so it's fine. Uh, they've done that with a lot of cards that just once per turn. But, like, the fact that you just do the same thing every turn is kind of, like, the reason why play patterns are kind of boring, but, like, the reason why cards like this are so good. Dreams of Steel and Oil is one of the best sideboard cards we've seen for Grease Fang in a long time. Hitting Grease Fang and the thing in their yard is so good. Oh, so best sideboard is, cards against Grease Fang. Yes. Uh, being able to play this against Grease Fang to exile their Barhalion that they milled or their Essex Chariot and then taking the Grease Fang out of their head and exiling both of them so they can't even can't stay away the, the Grease Fang. Very good. We'll see little play outside of that, but an out standing card for that purpose all right talking about obstinate Bayloth, uh it is now pioneer legal which means that with that since liliana is also now pioneer legal and croxa it is a card that you can play against rakdos midrange i guess and also aggro decks i mean we already had uh like two effects like this so there was already locked it on smiter right and there's like yeah one we had locked on smiter and uh no hide yeah no hide fair ox but the reason why i think this one makes the difference is that that four life matters. Um, and previously playing green and white cards and trying to put Smiter in your deck was kind of a fool's game. Um, you just had better things to do on three. But Obstinate Bailoff is also just like a roadblock for anything that's trying to be aggressive. The fact that it stabilizes you against four life is huge. I can't wait to go through for the throat my opponent's Grave and Trespasser and put in a Bailoff four blocks. All right. yeah, this card's great. Uh, we'll see play. Um, for... It sees play over um, Locked on Smiter because it's castable in more decks, and it sees more play than Ferris because Ferris is bad. I can see it maybe being in Necros Ramp sideboard, maybe. Uh, that sideboard's really competitive, though. I don't think so. It, the, the black discard matchups is also not something you really care about in that deck, and the, the, there's a massive opportunity cost of putting sideboard cards in your deck. But um, I'll, I'll never rule it out. The card's powerful. All right. Do you want to skip the white card? Um, I'll talk about it briefly. It's a card that can, um, so it's Great Desert Surveyor, 4 and a white, 3-2. When any ETBs create a tapped power stone equal to uh, for each other creature you control, um, it just has the potential to make a lot of mana on your opponent here. And depending on what the white uh, prototype card looks like, this could be a potential option in formats like Standard, but we'll see you play basically nowhere else other than maybe like weird EDH decks. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what I have to say. All right. Then we have Zephyr Sentinel, which is the best white lane, white main line that's ever been printed, I think. Yeah, this card is real good. Um, it's optional. It has flash and flying. It hits bigger. And um, it's a human. And it's a human. Like, it checks a lot of boxes. Like, this card's super sweet. So you can uh, pick up your lieutenants, I guess. Yeah, in, in your, like, bant human decks, being able to, like, play this to save a creature or pick up a lieutenant. Or just casting it in on the end step just to, you know, get in for beats. Like, card is fantastic. Love it. All right. I think we can move on from there. Uh, many cards down after that because we're starting to get into the draft shaft. Yeah. 
Uh, I um, do want to highlight No One Left Behind. So this card is similar to Can't Stay Away, which already sees play in Reese Fang. So if that deck is interested in five to eight more cop eight copies of that effect, it could see play there. Uh, also, Can't Stay Away makes the card Exile, which this one doesn't. Or yep. if there's another deck that wants that effect but also wants to pick up bigger creatures later in the game, this will do that too. Only problem I have with that analogy is that the flashback on Can't Stay Away actually matters Correct. a lot. In the games where you're casting it, like flashing it back will matter. So uh, I think that's a potential point where you could play, but I just love the design on rewarding you for cashing in when you should by making it cheaper. But this is also just a two mana on Earth that scales up. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting set of conditions to have, especially when they're putting a card like Phyrexian Dragon Engine, which you can just get this back in the draw three. So mm -hmm. I, I think the card's super interesting. And the fact that it's basically a two mana on Earth with additional text is really cool. All right, let's move on to uh, Artifact Lead the Stampede. Forging the Anchor. Oh, yeah. This card's... Okay. So it's Lead the Stampede, except you get Artifacts, and because you get Artifacts, you can make Artifact lands in your deck, which means you can get even more cards than you would normally. Yeah, and it's also usually cheaper to cast Artifacts if you want to. Correct. Yeah, so, this I mean, obviously it's a different card. You're getting different things with it. Lead the Stampede only saw play in really, what, Elves decks? It saw play outside of Standard basically just in, like, Elves-type decks. But the fact that it's artifacts, like, instead of creatures, is a lot of a difference. Like, so this you card can, can find a lot where? of powerful cards that you can cast for free. Like, so we've got uh, Urza decks, Affinity. I mean, this card finds Moxie. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it's unreasonable to try and cast this card in old formats. Like, you can find a lot of powerful cards with this. And three mana is a lot for those formats sometimes, but if you're playing soul lands, like you can just cast this on two, find three things, cast them immediately. Like I think it's got potential. Like this card's really good. Does legacy eight cast play enough artifacts for this? I have to imagine. So the only problem I think I would have is do you want to spend three mana on just a card draw spell? So let's Especially see. So that, that deck plays. So the non artifacts that the deck plays are uh, thought cast, Psy, Emery, and is Kappa an artifact? Kappa Cannoneer is, in fact, an artifact. Also worth noting, just small side, why does that card trigger itself? Because because wizards. Yeah, it's just, the card triggers itself. Just remember that if you're playing in paper and you're playing mm -hmm. in cast. The card triggers itself. So, yeah, uh, Forging the Anchor, I don't know what it's going to go in, but it's going to go in something because it's great. Yep, I, I would be shocked if this card didn't see play within, like, three months. All right, can we move on to Calamity's Wake, the white card? Yep, very good. <laughs> All right, so we've got a card that is worse than any of the sideboard cards that do any one of the two things that it's doing, but the fact that it does both of them means that you can free up more sideboard slots. It also just, like, having more coverage when you want to play that kind of effect. There are decks that want to play, like, a Silence or that want to play, like, uh, Ravenous Trap type effects, but not enough to just put them in their deck. But the fact that this has a bunch of extra text for other matches, but also just like in those games is a big game. Like people are already playing Hallowed Moonlight, but this does the same thing as Hallowed Moonlight because you just cast it when they cast their Cascade. Yeah, so basically it's worse than Hallowed Moonlight or Rest in Peace when you're playing either of the decks that those cards hit, but it's the fact that it can hit both of them means you don't have to devote as many sideboard slots to either deck. Yeah, the fact that you can just, like, against Underworld Breach, cast this in response, or in your in response to your opponent's outburst, you can cast this. Like, the flexibility on the card is great. It's also a good uh, CEDH card, because those decks are already playing Silence I effects. have to imagine this is, like, one of the nuttiest white cards for CEDH that you've mm. ever seen. Now, why does the card exile itself? Do you know how nuts it would be to loop this? Just, okay. like, on your opponent's upkeep every turn if they're playing only sorcery speed. Yeah, but, like, Silence doesn't exit. Like, none of those Silence cards exile themselves, do they? No, but I think it's a good thing to add. Okay. I do think I want to talk about uh, Corrupt and Flow of Knowledge. Okay. Uh, Corrupt, reprint, um, super cool in standard. Uh, I don't know if we'll see a Mono Black deck come back after the printing of Corrupt. I think it's definitely possible. But um, I want to say this could hit at an Urborn reprint, which every single person would be in favor of. Um, and I'm also okay putting it through standard with a, with a card like Corrupt. Being able to play like Mono Black with Corrupt would be sweet. Um, a bunch of these cards, like there's a whole cycle of the Corrupt cycle with Flow of Knowledge. I think Flow of Knowledge is kind of interesting. Um, 
we haven't seen blue card draw in exactly this way, uh, but it can see you a lot of cards if you're playing enough actual islands. Uh, I don't know how many you need to play in order to consider this as a real five mana draw spell, but it's interesting. But yeah, that's all I had to say about it. All right, uh, go for the throat. Go for the throat. We got a disgustingly good removal spell for Pioneer. Holy moly. <laughs> so Pioneer already had, so the, the next best mono black removal spells at two for creatures in that format were Infernal Grasp, Power Word Kill, and there's one other one, uh, Heartless Summoning, or not Heartless Summoning, Heartless, Heartless uh, Act. Act, yeah. Uh, this, I think the restriction on this is better than any of those ones. Be not close. Because the only artifact creatures that you even care about killing in Pioneer are basically Karn Tutoring for Meteor Golem, and then, the, and then there, yeah, hearse, and then there's like so artifacts. So like the grease fang artifacts, we just shoot grease fang, so it doesn't matter exactly. there. And then like, I so think that's basically think, it. Yeah, I think go for the throat is good enough that it would eat into the four push numbers that people are playing. Like I think if you're considering playing a lot of black removal, I think you might consider playing three push and a go for the throat, and playing a second go for the throat over the fourth push, because you. Like in the times when you're playing uh, push on a three drop, you're usually using like something like a blood to turn it on anyway. So just casting go for the throw just makes it easier to always kill the thing you need to kill. Not having a blood around when your opponent plays Mayhem Devil is a problem. But yeah, just go for the throw, just always answers it. Yeah. Um, maybe gives a chance for something like its soul to move into the format if people start playing a lot of go for the throw, which I'm all for. Um, and uh, and Soul also got a bunch of potential cards in this set, so thumbs up for me. Go for the throats, very welcome. Uh, there's also Urza, Power Stone Prodigy, and Mishra Excavation Prodigy, which are three mana creatures that you pay one and you loot or rummage, and then when you discard, you either make a Power Stone or you add double red mana. I yeah, they're interesting. I couldn't find anything to do with them. I was trying to figure out if I could break them because, like, Mishra makes an additional mana, but yeah, there was nothing I could find that let you, like, bust that ability open. Yeah, and it doesn't do anything that, like, cards like Generator Servant aren't already doing the better, but, you know, I don't know. Um, I think they're interesting cards, and I think for formats like Popper CDH, or Popper EDH, it seems, like, super interesting, but also just, like, in, like, a Peasant Cube. Like, I think these cards are super interesting, and they don't have a whole lot of general constructive playability, but I think people who want to play with, like, cool cards like this will have a good deck. All right, Lay Down Arms, the newest Swords to Plowshares. Uh, Boy, is it good. It is good. So obviously, so okay, there's a couple of things about it. It requires that you play a whole bunch of planes, but they don't have to be basic planes. So you either need to be playing a mono white deck or you need to be playing a multicolor white deck that is significantly slanted towards white so that you have enough for it. Or if you only care about killing small creatures and you have a deck that's going to reasonably be able to play two to three planes, then it could go there also. Yeah. Um, I only really see this in the mono white control ish decks. So, like mono white devotion, pioneer, and the mono white control deck standard. But I am so for this kind of design and giving white more um, removal with different kinds of restrictions. I think it sees Card is super cool. basically no play in modern because it's not as good as prismatic or leyline binding. We have like four cards that are already better than it yeah. and in this way. Um, like Path is better than it and Path isn't even playable. Yeah, and in Pioneer, it is somewhat competing with Portable Hole, but it does have higher upside than that. Yeah, um, it's definitely a choice to play like this in Portable Hole, but like I think... Because uh, the non-red versions of Mono White right now are playing like three March and four Portable Hole, but now you put Lay Down Arms into that uh, into that category, and now you have like really efficient answers for things. Um, I do want to step back and talk briefly about Gaia's Gift. Okay. Um, that is a lot of keywords. It costs Plus one counter, reach, trample, hexproof, indestructible. It's every blowout. In every way you can blow someone out with a green pump spell, it does. But it does cost two mana, which is the only downside. Um, well, Tamiyo's safekeeping is legal and standard, too. It is, but, like, you also, like, being able to block a creature of flying or getting in for the last points of damage when you're having, like, a big creature. Like, I don't necessarily think it has a home right now in standard, but it is a card that people could play in standard. And boy, howdy, can you really wreck someone with this card. 
Uh, I am super interested in potentially playing it, but uh, probably not going to happen. There's splitting the power stone. Kind of oh, interesting I... because it's a it's a way to ramp in blue, essentially. It's Harrow. So it's not that good, but like there's potential here. Yeah, it, I th think this is more of um, a signpost uncommon limited card. And I think the card is actually pretty interesting, but it's a way to turn something into two mana. Might see fringe standard play in some of the prototype type decks. They just want like want to cast things like Phyrexian Portal or Phyrexian uh, Flesh Gorger. But yeah, card's cool. Probably not seeing a ton of constructive play, but I like the card. Moving on down, we have Recruitment Officer. It's another Savannah Lions with a bunch of text stapled to it. So Slam Dunk. I think it's better than uh, Soldier of the Pantheon. Yeah, Soldier of the Pantheon and the Mono White deck. It's yeah, also a human and a soldier. Uh, yeah, super, super in on this card. I love it. All right. I looked at Machine Over Matter briefly. I don't think it's that good. Uh, it's a better Disperse. Um, if you think you're going to have a lot of artifacts, like it's a one mana bounce spell. Like that's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, not like a super broadly playable card, but I think if you're playing a format like Pioneer or uh, Standard, definitely a card that's pretty decent. I want to talk about Pelagi Archaeologist. Pelagi Archaeologist um, evokes things similar to something like Augur of Volus. Augur of Volus was a card that was played a lot in Standard in its uh, times that it was printed. It's at least in the N14 era, not so much in the War of the Spark era. It's not fringe playing like Archaeolite sideboards. Uh, but Pelagi Archaeologist is so much better than Augur of Bulls. Doesn't care about the card type you mill nearly as much and get back things like Planeswalkers and Artifacts. And get, I think the notable card they can spec is Founding the Third Path. I think it's a super interesting card in the Temporal Trespass combo decks and just trying to win the game with Jace and Thoracle. Having a real two drop in that deck is really important. Having it actually be a card that draws you a card too and it facilitates your Trespass plan is super powerful. It also just defaults to being a 1-4 if you need the blocker, I think the card's super interesting. I think it has a lot of potential space to play, and it's really easy to overlook a card like this. Bitter Reunion, similarly, is um, a card that can see Pioneer play in something like Enigmatic Fires. That deck already wants like two mana artifacts that are okay to sack, and then you got value out of their ETB. The reason why I think this can see play is because you can play it over Omen of the Sea and make your mana so much better, because... Playing Omen of the Sea, it's like your only blue card that you ever play early. But if you can shave on the amount of early blue sources and just play Bitter Reunion, you get a bunch of more equity out of your mana base. But I also think the activated ability is actually very relevant. Being able to give your Fable haste, being able to give your Titan haste, uh, being able to do like a bunch of other things with that ability, I think is perfectly reasonable. And it lets the, the big point I think is the mana base, but it has text on also being able to turn a card into your hand into another real card is awesome. Fantastic. So that deck plays a bunch of one ofs that aren't good in certain matchups. I also want to talk overwhelming remorse. Yeah. So um needs to go in some kind of self mill deck so you can get the cost down far enough to actually make it good. I think it um can see play in like popper cycle. Uh, that deck doesn't really want to have to pay six life or four life or whatever for snuff out. Um, but paying one mana isn't that bad. And just unconditionally killing whatever you need to kill, not giving any death triggers, awesome. Um, I don't know how many uh, creatures Greasefang reasonably puts in its graveyard, but I would look at it there too. Maybe. Um, I think the only problem with playing Overwhelming Remorse is that you'll need interactive spells that are more type agnostic. Like, you want more, like, abrupt decays yeah. than you want, like, you know, downfalls. I was also looking really at it in Dredge, but, the, again, the problem there is you need type agnostic removal. Exactly. And and that's part of the problem with, like, trying to put this in your graveyard decks is that you need type agnostic. And you need to be able to blow up things like Leyline and Hearse and uh, Planeswalkers that are a problem. But, um, yeah, so Overwhelming Remorse, I think, could definitely see play in Popper Cycling Storm, but I wouldn't be surprised if it saw play in other places. Oh, also Stern Lesson, uh, because the only place I could see this being played is in Mono Blue Tron, if it's all play there, because that's a deck that already plays Thirst for Knowledge, and this is doing something kind of similar to that. It's obviously worse cards, but you ramp. Yeah, you you get one less card, but like the Power Stone is actually a real card, so mm -hmm. huh? yeah, maybe. All right, we got multicolor cards. Sahili is a Planeswalker that protects yourself and draws cards, so probably it's good. 
kind of pedestrian, but I think it's actually pretty good. Basically, being able to ultimate the turn after your player is kind of interesting. The ultimate isn't like game winning, but it's pretty powerful. If you're playing, like you need to be playing creatures on the board to want to play this kind of card, I think. But good if you're doing, like quite good. It also doesn't care if they're tokens or not. So if you just spit out a bunch of tokens, like if you're playing, uh, we'll get to them later, but the blue, red, the new Pyromancer, yep. it spits out artifact tokens. Mishra claimed by Gix is, as you said earlier, kind of Hellrider, except you gain life, but it doesn't have haste, and then it melds. Yeah, um, five toughness is a lot. If you ever meld it and lose, I want to know how. Yeah, I don't think it'll see a ton of play outside of like standard, but I think it's super interesting. For my own personal sake, I've like put it into decks and legacy, but I don't think it's very good. But I, I like doing weird things like that, especially with cards with ancient doom mana in them. But yeah, card's interesting. Um, if you ever flip it, congratulations on your win. Um, but yeah, card's interesting. Uh, Death Bloom Ritualist is one of those cards that looks like you can generate a ton of mana with it, and then it, you realize that it's already five mana, and so what's the point? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's in a, some sort of a Necrotic Use CDH deck where you just put this in your graveyard and it's like an outlet to a combo. Yeah, I mean, there's like already cards that do that, but sure. It also does yeah. that. I don't know. That's my only thought when I look at the card. It's a five mana mana dork. I don't know what it's doing. All right, Takazia, Dig Site Mentor, is a card that has an ability that's not really that great, and then it has another ability that's a graveyard thing that costs way too much. Worth noting that um, it, you activate the ability from the yard, so you get to mill it over and then activate it. I think, it, I mean, that makes it worse for something like Commander, but like in constructed formats, like that's actually an interesting thing because you can just discard it for value and then activate its ability to win the game later. I find it hard to imagine this card has a home or and you can build a deck around it, but a cool fact, and I'm I'm happy it exists in standard and people get to try playing. Do you have anything to say about Hajar? Yeah, holy moly. Bard class got a big upgrade and that's a beefy boy. Yeah. Um two mana three three, text your other legends. Um exact this is like the exact kind of card the Bard class deck. Other than like a one mana legendary dork. Yeah, this card is fantastic and specifically that deck and not a whole lot else. All right, then we got Harbin. I'm going to say that we are going to ignore this attack with five guys uh, uh, mode. And just so I think m m almost all the time you can ignore that, but yeah. it hits like a truck. It's a soldier. It's a human. It has flying. I was looking um, to see, is there any card that's that cost with three power or more that has evasion? And there isn't. Yeah, there really isn't. This... This thing hits hard and very quickly, and you can't really do a whole lot about it. Like, really interesting. Um, so it should I'm show up in the, this... like, Pioneer Multicolor Humans decks? Yeah, maybe. Um, like, in the Bant Humans decks that play, like, Coco, like, this is a good two-drop. I don't know if it'll be, like, this or the uh, the two-drop of Flash, but, like, both of those are real options, and I think that's interesting for that deck. I looked at Thanos. And the problem is that there are not really that many actually good beasts or birds to copy with it. There are some, but not really that much. Also, there's just better yeah. things you can be doing in Commander than this card. I think it's a sweet cube card. Um, uh, my friend has a Pioneer cube, and this is one of the cards he was excited about putting into it. And I think it's cool for basically exactly that purpose, not a whole lot else. All right, what do you have to say about Urza, Prince of Krug? We got Tempered Steel and Pioneer! Except it's also a creature and one more mana, but it's Tempered Steel. Yeah, but uh, I, I, the way I look at this card is I completely ignore that part, and I say, okay, how do we break the copy ability? There's an artifact creature in this set. Uh, it's the Suchi yeah, Guardian. The giant onulet guy or whatever the card is. Yeah, with that, with this, and with um, a one mana sack outlet, you can generate infinite mana. <laughs> And then need a, well, hmm, I guess once you have infinite mana, you can just copy your guys infinitely. And then you have infinite you creatures. A, so you, you just have make to make a giant army. So you just have to play this and then spend eight mana on a card that doesn't do anything. I guess it would do something when you play it. Okay, so you need this. You need a sack outlet that doesn't cost you any mana. And then you need. Well, to... you can spend one mana. Sure. So let's say you go uh, sack outlet, Urza, get to eight, cast your eight drop, sack it. Untap. Yeah, or cost reduce the eight drop with cost reducer effect, or cheat it into play somehow. This is a long way of us saying that we don't think that's very good. No, it isn't. But it's cool. It is cool. And that's what's important. All right, then we've got Mishra. I have nothing to say about Mishra. Um, I'm surprised you've been mentioning CADH all night and haven't like thought about this card. CADH. Eh, each artifact you can has put in things like Citadel. 
I mean, sure. Just kill them on the spot. It's like a lot of. I mean, it's a lot of setup. You have to pay your yeah, five mana commander and then untap. That isn't blue. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's fair. Queen Caleb bin Krug, however, holy friggin' moly! <laughs> I don't really know what you do with this. So okay, I don't like the fact that it's a three mana two three that is nothing when you play it. But the ability, okay, so you discard all your cards and then you can put a bunch of artifacts into play, I guess. Well, creatures mostly, I think. Um, but it puts six mana worth of creatures in play for no card cost. So basically, it's sort of like a a Boros three drop that has collected company staple to it, sort of. Yeah, it's basically a Coco you get to cast every turn, and you can abuse in a lot of ways. So, like, for example, you could put in a uh, Archfiend's vessel and then get a five five out of it on top of like your Reflector Mages and your two drops like Harbin or something. But I think this card's super powerful. If your opponent does not answer this, they are very likely to lose the game. Can this see play beyond standard? I, I'm talking about this mostly for Pioneer. So Pioneer, Multicolor Humans again. It's your creature. It's your creature, yeah. Coco. Yeah, and it basically lets you play eight Cocos, and this card le- like can just destroy your opponent. Like if you put in like two or three things with this, you just kind of win. And again, they still have to kill it, or you do it again, and it costs you no cards. Yeah, this card is scary. Uh, if you are if you play any amount of Pioneer, you might die to this card. We have Third Path Iconoclast. It's Young Pyromancer, except you can cast any non-creature spell, not just instants and sorceries. Holy, we got a better Young Pyromancer. And the one ones it makes are also artifacts. Yeah, the fact that they're colorless, the fact that it's non-creature spell, like, it checks off the boxes of, Py- of Pyromancer, and it's better. Uh, weirdly enough, it costing blue is actually an upside in some formats because it actually pitches the force of will and uh, force negation. So young pyromancer like, sees play where right now? Like it's in it's in sideboards and pioneer. It's mostly like... just in pioneer, but I think this card specifically could see play in formats like like. Hmm. Yeah, like I, mean... I think this card has a huge ceiling. Not necessarily going to be there, but you cast bobble, you get this. You cast a mox, you get this. You cast anything. And you well, get... we know that it's at least better than young pyro so yeah and since young pyro sees play it will see play yeah um worth noting it's also an additional set of pyros for the uh the of one mind deck in pioneer so now you can just play of one mind to be happy about it and just play this and balnor and young pyromancer and just kill people mm-hmm. i want to talk briefly about uh yoshin Distant. okay um uh, so there's a deck in pioneer right now that has been on the fringes for a while, but has been wanting a couple of cards. There's at least two cards from this set uh, this deck absolutely wanted, and that's uh, Green White Hardened Scales. It plays, I think it's Guardian of the Conclaves and Hardened Scales as its enablers. Are you talking about Conclave played... Mentor? Conclave Mentor, thank you. Uh, Conclave Mentor and Hardened Scales to like get the additional value out of your plus and bullswing creatures. But then Yoshin Dissident also helps trigger these effects. So you like your hanging back walkers and I'm going to skip ahead real quick. Uh, it pairs with a clay champion, uh, clay champion going with uh Yoshin distant in these kinds of decks, I think is something people will figure out. And even if Yoshin distant doesn't see play clay champion, absolutely will in those decks. But I think there's a lot of potential for Yoshin distant really easy. Just like put artifacts into play get counters, get additional counters because of hardened scales, and just make giant BB creatures that kill your opponent very quickly. All right, uh, moving on. There is the mythic artifact that is foreign, uh, Platoon Dispensary. Yeah. Is this card any good? That's a good question. Um, So I believe this is our first Unearth card. Um, Unearth coming back from Shards of Alarabach. Um, this one specifically, it's weird because initially Unearth was printed as like a, we're going to use this to get additional value out of our aggressive creatures but then most of the unearth cards in this uh, that they've shown us so far are very much not aggressive cards they're very much like mid-range value cards this is a very interesting mana sink for something like the mono white control next and standard um works very well in tandem with cards like winning announcement and wandering emperor so you can trigger and draw cards very quickly probably see zero play beyond that but super sweet all right then we've got liberator urza's battle thopter which has really weird art they're terrifying art what the hell is that face <laughs> uh it is better shimmer mer, basically uh yeah that sounds accurate so if you wanted shimmer mer somewhere here's a better one yep all right moving on the stasis coffin is a card that i see a bunch of people talking about and i'm trying to figure out why so it is another people car- 
It's another yeah, Karn wishboard just... target, and they're like, oh my god, you can grab this and protect yourself. I'm like, sure, but then they just kill Karn. So like, like I don't know. Uh, I, I definitely see the appeal, especially since it also exiles itself, but uh, it just doesn't do anything. And the Mono Green Karn deck is very proactive. There's other cards we're going to see very soon that I think we'll see play in, in the Karn wishboards, but I don't think one of them. Yeah, so Interesting card, though. Stasis Coffin, I look at it and I don't see a Karn wishboard. I see how do we break this? How do we, what effects are like both players take lethal damage and then you just don't? Or like the Dex and Legacy where you just skip all the rest of your turns kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's also another reasonable angle to think about it from. I couldn't find any cards that allow you to do that. Like, you need something that either, like, deals 20 immediately or that you can just activate for free, and there's nothing. Yeah. Interesting card, though. Um, I just don't know what you're supposed to do with it. All right. Portal to Phyrexia is 9 mana, so it's way too expensive, but I guess you can welder it in Legacy. I also don't think it's unreasonable for Mono Green to cast. Uh... Like, if you cast this, you just win. I, I think... It might be a little overkill, but if you cast this, you're winning the game. Sure. It's more like, but do you want to take another card out of your sideboard for this card? Yeah, that that I don't think is true, but I think it's interesting to think of that. I do think this is a very good extra set of God Pharaoh's gift, and you can refer this into play, and it also immediately wraths your opponent's board, so... Yeah, I think the card's super interesting. Mm -hmm. And we've got Urza Silex. So we have yet another Silex after Karn Silex. Uh, this one blows up everything. So you can't modulate it the same way you can with Karn Silex. So your Karn is going mm -hmm. to die. Although you also have enough... If you have enough mana, you can pay the two and go get another Karn. Yeah. Um... It costs double white. The Nykthos Ramp decks are playing white now for... Teferi, Who Sells the Sunset, and Sideboard White cards. At the same time, it still can be dubious being able to have double white. Yeah. But Karn Silex also enters the battlefield tapped. This doesn't. So I don't know if this will see play. If it does, I imagine it's in the sideboard of Karn decks, and that's it. Yeah. I see it mostly as like a standard control card. This is more just like a default sweeper to me. I think the Planeswalkers you're going to grab with this are going to be either Teferi, just because that card's good, or Elspeth Resplendent to find another one. Yeah, like, I guess it doesn't have to go in corn, but... Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's... I, I do have to admit, it, it's exhausting to think of every artifact and, like, this could go on my corn wish board. Why are all of these artifacts exiling themselves now? Yeah. Like, this one, Stasis Coffin, Karn Silex from the last set also exiled itself. There's more... Yeah. We're gonna get some more artifacts that exile themselves. So, I, I think it's good that they do, it's just that Karn breaks it in a weird way, and I think getting rid of Karn is a really easy fix. But um, I also just, like, we could have a discussion about Karn another time. But, um, yeah, I think it's a good thing that Exile themselves is just unfortunate that it works too well with Karn. All right. Uh, Arcane Proxy is my pick of the set. It is... I, I think this card's very good. Snapcaster Mage, but there's some notable differences. So here's all the differences I could find. Uh, the card that you get back is you cast for free and is based on the mana value, or sorry, the power of Arcane Proxy. And you have to cast arcane proxy and it has the bigger seven mana mode so the differences are sometimes you cast snapcaster mage on two and get nothing back with it just as a blocker or as a tempo play which this does not do when you have three mana it and it and snapcaster are basically the same card and when you have when you want to get back a spell that costs two arcane proxy is better because it costs you one less after that snapcaster is better again because snapcaster can flash back stuff like colligan's command which proxy cannot and then proxy has a bigger late game payoff as the four three which isn't like that great but it is a bigger well, flashback take command like it's a bigger threat than snapcaster itself is because you have to cast the arcane proxy you can't blink it with like resto angel which you can do with snapcaster mage and lastly because the proxy casts the spell for free, you can flash back Crashing Footfalls and the Cascade cards with it. Yep. Yeah, if it has an application in Modern, it feels like it's, that's the spot for it. Um, and also, also because it's because it's 7 mana, you can play it in the Cascade decks. Yep. Um, also, Snapcaster's not legal in Pioneer, so I assume this is an auto-slam dunk in Pioneer. Yeah, this definitely has homes in Pioneer. Um, worth noting for Modern, too, there are some versions of Rhinos. I don't think they exist as much anymore, but there's some versions of Rhinos that were playing Karn. This is a card you could grab off Karn in those decks to just get more Rhinos, uh, if that's, like, if your Rhinos countered or something. I think this has a million different applications in Pioneer, one of which is you can flashback See the Truth off of it and draw three. Just having this kind of effect is 
really powerful. The scalability also matters in a format like Pioneer. There is a single blink spell, even illegal in Pioneer, that you can cast with this that works with its ability, and I'll mention it with, it with all of the, the prototypes, uh, and that's Release to the Wind. With Release to the Wind, you can just cast it for its front side and get the full value out of it. And I think it's better for cards like Flesh, uh, Flesh George, uh, which I love to call my boy. But yeah, I think this has a million different applications in a format like Pioneer. And it could see play in a format like Modern, where you can just play it on three and flashback something like a two drop, if that matters. Uh, but yeah, super excited about this card. think it's fantastic. I think it is definitely going to be one of the chase movements of the set. Super happy with it. Love this card. We got Clay Champion, which is either a big boy or puts counters on other stuff. And you were mentioning there's a Pioneer Scales deck. Yeah, um, I th there's a green-white Scales deck that plays um, uh, eight of those effects and would want something like this. Like The reason why they're not super happy with Verdurus Skill Hook is that it costs five. Having it costs four actually makes it a real card in those decks. I don't think you should cast this card if you aren't playing white mana. Yeah, it's too. It doesn't have trample or anything, so it's not good. As yeah, it's just a four mana eight eight. Like, yeah, that's cool, but we had Gigantosaur before, and that cost five green for a ten ten. It was on zero play. I also think immediately getting the presence of the board and being able to turn that into the combat damage also matters, and diversifying the value you get from this kind of card. The fact that it scales up is something that's super cool. So when you get to six mana, you're just like, cool. I'm just going to spend two more white mana on this, get more counters, or I'm going to spend two more green mana and just have an eight eight two. So. I think the fact both of this card scales and that it immediately gives you board presence, like a card like Verdurus Gear Hulk, is kind of interesting. And Verdurus Gear Hulk did see play. And the fact that it's a cheaper Verdurus Gear Hulk makes me excited. I have no comment on Skitter Beam Battalion. Do you? This is a weird card. It's a six uh, mana. It's five mana for six power haste or nine mana for 12 power haste. Yeah. Um, it does work really well with the four drop Mishra. Like, you just kill your opponent if you carry Mishra into this. Like, you're attacking your opponent like well or something um, and that's just those two cards but aside from that i don't see it in a lot of places it is the most expensive and the most theoretically powerful card to cast for its front side so if you have a way to abuse that maybe notably with this and like arcane proxy uh it cares about you casting it so you have to cast it to get the additional cook tokens mm -hmm. no blinking Flush scorcher does not have that problem <laughs> breaks your flesh scorcher all right so moving uh, on to flesh scorcher Jesus Christ. So Flesh Gorger is the actual like Karn sideboard card because that one I think so. actually comes down and stabilizes against all the aggro decks. And, and... Uh, and it's not unreasonable to cast on three either. Yeah, it's not impossible. Like uh, even for the green decks, you could just play black mana like something they used to do anyway. So uh, the way I looked at it is, is there a way to abuse this with flicker effects? Can you play this like with Ephemerate or Flicker Wisp? Oh, and yeah. The uh, evidence against that is that a Chroma Angel of Fury has been a card forever and has not seen play with this. Like, yeah, but not three, play. Two, three mana, two, two vanilla morph. But yeah, so but the upside is that the the playing it on three is better than a morphed angel. Yes. Also, I think this it's debatable which one of them is better on their normal side, but I think Lifelink is a big upside. Lifelink is very good for this kind of card, especially for a card that's scalability where it's like it trying to get itself to the late game to be able to get there. Um, yeah, you also just get to blink this card. Like, you can Charming Prince it, you can Restoration Angel and Ephemerate it, obviously, but, like, I'm interested in doing this in the format, like, Standard, where I can just, like, Planar Incision it or Touch the Spirit Realm it and just have this giant monster way too ahead of the curve. I've already brewed a bunch of decks with this card. I This is my choice for the my favorite Chase Mythic in the set. It is just a big, dumb pile of stats, but, jeez, it's a fun way to work with certain card interactions um i do think that uh there are will be archetypes in both pioneer and standard that abuse this card um being able to play something like charming prince with this there's already a black white mid-range deck in uh pioneer and they would want a reasonable three drop like this that just like trades and gains you some life but also has really good scalability and paying seven is a lot like if your opponent has to pay seven to interact with this and then you blink it they lose and it's oh man i i'm a huge fan of this card i am going to have a ton of fun casting this card on the front side and the back side like mwah, i love it mm -hmm. i'm mostly looking at it as a uh, car and wish board but yeah it's got it's good a good application Fair enough. For the rest i of think this. it's reasonable there too 
Uh, I have nothing to say about Surge Engine. I imagine it's probably good in standard and blue control decks. Good in standard in a lot of kinds of decks. Uh, anything that plays blue, you can consider this. Um, it's an unblockable creature. It gets bigger. Like, Figure of Destinies has basically always been playable. And this is actually, I think, a really good one. All right. Persistent Behemoth is not as good as Ramanop Excavator. So, I mean... That's not fair. Wrong on the finish kind of thoughts. But it's it's more just the fact that it's another one for like your EDH decks. Like I think this card's super cool. I'm going to be playing it in standard in some capacity. Like I've been fiddling with a bunch of like splendid reclamation decks with Titania. I think this is a really good card in it. Seven is a lot of toughness. That survives a lot of stuff. Like it just barely dies to at least the Inferno, but that's about it. That's like the only red card that kills us. And then moving on from there, we've got Steel Seraph, the white prototype card, which is a 3-3 flyer. This one, I think I'm super excited. Baseline, it's a 3-mana 3-3 with flying, and it also gets Vigilance or Lifelink. That's pretty good. And on the turn you play it, you can give something flying Vigilance or Lifelink. So your true drop can get in with flying, and then you can untap it, and it no longer makes sense to do that. You can just give this Lifelink and start crunching in. Like, I love this card. I think this card's super good, both on the front side and the back side. Like, I think this is actually one of the prototype cards where you're primarily thinking about it for casting it for the cheaper cost, whereas trying to abuse it, trying to get the max sides. Yeah. yeah is, I'm this good enough in, is this good enough to blink in older formats? Probably not. Um, but I think that's okay. Uh, so, Like, I would you play in it, Charming Prince decks, for example? In Pioneer? Yeah, I would definitely consider it. Um, also worth noting, uh, we haven't gotten the, uh, the judge announcement to uh, confirm it yet, but Based off of the rules as written and what the abilities say, this adds devotion. So if you cast this, if on you cast three, it on, uh, it's a yeah. On if you cast it with the, for the prototype, this adds two white devotion. Correct. So you could put this in like your mono white devotion deck, just like as your three drop, and like that's perfectly reasonable. Like that's like that's, that's a card that people could play, and that also scales up. It's like I think this card's super cool. I think prototype as a design will probably go down as like a super interesting design that they explored. And I don't know, maybe there was a lot of weird things with it, but I think all of the cards basically hit the right numbers and had the right text on them so far that I don't think anything is really broken. It's just like you, there's interesting things that you get to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we got Monkey Robot. Monkey Robot! <laughs> is probably not good. Uh, goes into the Hard Scales deck. <laughs> also just like a good three drop in the in like standard green decks because sure. it's a three drop three four three that comes back is thran spider any good yes i think it is so it's a three it's a basically a three mana blocker that sort of ramps you yeah i mean it definitely ramps you and it feeds into its own ability um and i think that ability is good um but i think it it definitely needs other things to go with it but i think the big thing is that thran spider curves into might hmm. and in any deck all right uh, moving on from that, we have the Stone Brain. So everybody gets a cranial extraction. And, yeah, I, al and also Karn. Yeah. So putting Karn aside for a second, I love everyone having access to an inefficient cranial extraction. I think that is very good for constructed format. However, this plus Karn just makes green mirrors unbearable. It's whoever gets Karn and activates Stone Brain first one. And nothing else really matters. I assume you just extract Nykthos and then it's game over. Or Karn. Or Karn. Yeah, one of the yeah, two. Yeah, if they can't Karn, they can't fight you. Well, yeah, I mean, they can still like go off too. with Nykthos and put like a bunch of creatures in play or something. So I think sure, they get like one turn to like maybe generate a big board. Um, but yeah, that's so much of the mono green mirrors. Like that part I don't like. Um, also worth noting, this part card is probably going to be seventy dollars in Atlanta the weekend of regional championships, <laughs> which. Oh, God, I hate even thinking about that. All right, uh, we've got Transmogrant's Crown. So this is worse Skull Clamp. So the question, it's Skull Clamp, yeah. So the question is, how much worse than Skull Clamp is it? A uh, good bit. Um, doesn't kill creatures on its own, which was one of the big reasons why Skull Clamp was good. Costs um, more, costs more to equip or color to equip. Doesn't kill stuff. Yeah. Um, Would Raksak want this? Absolutely not. If a deck wants this, it's definitely a black deck that wants to attack. And we just got Yawgmoth, so I doubt people are going to want to play Transmogrant's Count unless they're already playing like three Yawg or Gix. Yeah, playing three Gix. I find it a little tough to imagine a home for it. 
very cool and also like another skull clamp for the black decks and commander which i think is like totally reasonable all right moving on we've got phyrexian dragon engine so reasonable enough on its front side better if you unearth or goblin engineer it uh that's yeah, basically the um, only application i see for it is it's a tutor target for goblin engineer yep It'll see yeah, play it in Goblin Engineer decks. Yeah, I think there definitely can be decks in Standard that will want to play Engine plus uh, Misha. I think both of those cards are perfectly reasonable in the format as just, like, regular cards. Like, 3 mana 2-2 two, two with Double Strike works really well with, like, some of the pump spells or just, like, anything that boosts attack. I mean, it's not that hard to do. Like, it curves really well in a Wandering Emperor that you can just eat their blocker. Yeah, I think the card's playable. I think if it sees play it's in the turtle format, it's probably with Unearth or um, Engineer. So, yeah, he's sort of perfectly reasonable. All right, we've got the Might Stone and Weak Stone, yet another Karn Wishboard card. That but, is correct. And it does other things, but it's also in Karn Wishboards. Because yeah, it's just because it's, uh, it's Sky it's Sovereign that kills bigger spell. stuff and also yeah. draws cards and ramps you. Yeah, this card's really good. Um, it also you can use the mana to filter into Nyctus. I think it has. Okay, so it could see play in Standard, in Karn Wishboards and Pioneer, and probably nowhere else. Yeah, I mean, I I think it also could see play in uh, Karn Wishboards and Modern. Like, I think decks like Etron would be totally okay grabbing this instead of like Sky Sovereign or something because it also kills something but it draws cards. Yeah, I, I that's basically all I ever see it. Don't think it gets to see play in anywhere else, but yeah, Karn Wish boards and in formats like Pioneer and Standard. Um, I think there are some uh, Pioneer decks that'll play this without Karn, and I think that's perfectly reasonable, uh, especially decks like Metal Word Colossus. I think this card's super cool. Mm-hmm. Having modality to this kind of card is interesting, but maybe a little pushed. Having a colorless card both kill things and draw cards and also still make mana, like, that's that's a lot of action. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. And then moving on directly below that, we have Mishra's Research Desk, which is a one mana artifact that exiles two and you choose one, you get to play that within a turn cycle. Also has Unearth and is very reminiscent of Experimental Synthesizer and what it's doing. But it's also uh, one mana. So I think the best way to think about this is that this is red thing twice. Cost two mana for a card and then cost three mana for a card. Yes, but it's sagaable. That is true. That's what I'm looking at it for. Because right now, Urza Saga doesn't have a good card advantage thing to grab. Because the only things that can grab that generate card advantage are basically Expedition Map in some decks and Brainstone. Yeah, but no one plays Brainstone. Yeah. So- yeah in red Saga decks, this could definitely play. Yeah, I think this is just, like, the best thing to find. Like, you could put this as a one-of in, like, Amulet Titan, so you can just grab this when you need something that isn't Amulet of Vigor or Map. Sure, and you can just tap your Rule Turf to activate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's invisible. Uh, I do think Combat Thresher is constructed playable. It's uh, a three-drop with Double Strike that draws a card, and it scales up. Like, that's perfectly reasonable. Curves into Wandering Emperor. The best the best well of them to Blink, maybe, other than Flush Gorger, probably. Yeah. Because you draw cards off that's, of it. It seems like it so far. Uh, you draw cards, it it's a 3 3 with double strike. That's scary. Um, the fact that it works well with Wandering Emperor is really a thumbs up for me. Uh, works well with any pump effects, like Wedding Announcement, thumbs up. Like, I love this card. But yeah. the mono white control I could say already wanted, like, three drops that draw a card and do other things. This is another one for the pump white. And then moving on down to land. Fortified Beachhead, uh, confirmed, not a cycle, but totally okay. Great card. I'm pretty happy about it. So if there's no tribal soldier deck, but there could be, but also it could just go into like a blue white humans deck since there's enough soldiers in that deck to turn it on. Possibly. I think the mana is good enough right now that you don't need to be doing that kind of thing, but definitely I think it has potential if you are playing uh, like standard soldiers. Like I think that will be a deck. Well, another thing about it is that, so for example, Modern Humans, so that deck will play a bunch of Rainbow Rainbow Lands, like Ancient Ziggurat and whatnot, but one of the issues that deck runs into is that you also want to play sideboard cards that are in other colors, so Fortified Beachhead helps you do that. It also helps you have lands that tap for your humans, but also tap for Phantasmal Image. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I I do like the design on it rather than with like the old ones from Lorwyn where you had to reveal it but now it's also reveal or control and then it also has an additional ability on top of that i love the design on this great card argoth is the land that smells with titania it is okay i think it's actually pretty good having a land that just like makes blockers and facilitates uh, other game plans i think it's super interesting 
plus like having this super powerful late game with titania makes it really good and the opportunity to cost is incredibly low isn't it kind of weird that this is not legendary so the one of the reasons why it's not is that having trying to put a, a legendary land in your deck that you want to draw to work with other cards in your deck or that you want to draw in a lot of your games it's just like a natural conflict um making them non-legendary for gameplay purposes and sacrificing a little bit of flavor i think it's totally reasonable but it's just yeah it de definitely feels awkward but i'm glad it's not legendary so that way i can have two of them in play and not have to be scared about sacrificing one of them so you think this card would be good enough even without titania pretty close i mean i think we're a little spoiled with field of the dead and the fact that that card just takes over games by its own but this is kind of like a fairer version of Castle Gear. It makes the 2-2 two -two and mills 3 instead of making... All right. Brushland is now Pioneer legal. Yay, Brushland and Underground River. Yay! Uh, we've got Mistress Foundry, which is a worse Mistress Factory slash Mutavault. But, I mean, if you want a Manland in Standard, this is it. It's a colorless Manland. Great for Standard. We'll see you play in Pioneer. Probably not in Modern, but... Hey, we're happy to see it. We've got Demolition Field, which is 99% the same thing as Field of Ruin. However, there are two things to note about it. So first is if you're playing a deck that is already playing Field of Ruin, like Blue Light Control, just split the amount of fields and Field of Ruin, the Demolition Fields yep. and Field of Ruins you play if you don't want more than four copies, just to get around like Pithing Needle effect. And then the second thing is that uh, you do not play this in Mill because it Unlike Field of Ruin, it doesn't force your opponent to search their deck, which means Archive Trap doesn't get turned on. Yep. Uh, worth noting for multiplayer formats that this, unlike Field of Ruin, is just you and them. Yep. All right, so that brings us to the end of Brothers War. Do At least for now. We still haven't gotten the full spoiler yet. Yeah, so we're at 167 we'll probably... cards out of 287. Yeah, we've seen most all of the rares. We're missing a couple of them. But I think we can come back and touch on them if we think they're... Uh they're good enough but yeah uh super excited about this set S slam dunks all around a bunch of very cool designs a bunch of really welcome reprints awesome set so far yep uh do we have any other thoughts on the set before we go oh i guess there's Co brothers war commander that we've seen some cards from sure do you want to talk about those but... so i don't remember exactly what all of these do i remember reading through them and not thinking that any of them are that great though because they're I only think... they're only commander and legacy legal basically and yeah none of them are really that fantastic of cards there's a couple of them that are like super cool designs um i think there was a small handful that i thought were cool for formats like legacy let me see if i can find oh yeah i do remember there was one uh yeah there was Root one artifact that i was looking at the basic one so you can play ruination and not hurt yourself or uh, slash no, wasteland doesn't work uh the reason why i'm actually excited about this is because uh it lets you do a bunch of nonsense with things like prismatic vista you can find things like um it turns prismatic vista into confrontation and being able to find like tabernacle or glacial chasm or maids of it or any of the utility lands just like off of a prismatic vista or a ghost quarter is pretty powerful that is good um, i my hesitance about it is that it's four mana it is four mana and it won't see it play in traditional lands decks but uh I think in the same shell that Titania goes into, this could see play in. Because it's a Green Sun Zenith and Fiend as a target that uh, has a lot of potential utility. You also just get to Wasteland your opponent's Wasteland, and that's hilarious. And then uh, if you go back up to the top, I believe Smelting Vat was one of the cards I was looking at. Oh, yeah. Four mana, artifact, one tap, sacrifice, another artifact, reveal the top eight cards of your library, put up to two non-creature artifact cards with total mana value, less than or equal to the sacrificed artifact's mana value, from among them onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom in a random order. I have no idea what you do with this, but it looks good enough. Yeah, I mean, um, it's both uh, a shame and probably good that there's not a whole lot of evoke artifacts. Because <laughs> this would be uh, pretty abusable with that. But yeah, I think the coolest thing I like about the commander cards is that their design space is super in. I'm not going to lie, when I saw the first previews on them, I thought they were standard legal cards. I was like, oh man, cards like Terra Sierra is Yeah, uh, I misread. Uh, I, thought, I thought Urza's Workshop was standard. Yeah, and it's like, you look at these and you're like, yeah, oh man, I get to play these in standard and other formats. And it's like, no, it's just Legacy and uh, Commander, which is fine. I just... Uh, I just wish they would explore more of these designs in standard legal spaces in the future. 
like Wreck Hunter looks super cool. Thopter Shop Parts. is also potentially legacy playable in eight cast because it turns all your baubles into draw two. Yeah. Like there's some interesting cards here. Nothing that seems like super capable of breaking into older formats, but the designs on these are super cool. Yeah. I think that's about all we have to say for now then. So we've got a hundred ish so cards left on uh, Brothers War left to be previewed. Previews yeah, and mo- mostly seems to be commons and uncommons. A couple of rares and mythics that we know are missing, but yeah, super happy to set support. Okay. Uh, yeah. You want to um, come back and do the rest of the set when they're finally out? Sure. Maybe do like a, a pre release review of like cards we think are cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you cool. for joining Thanks me. Thanks for today. having me, Ami. Always a pleasure. Mm-hmm. All right. Have a good night. Music